Minneapolis, a place where so many of my dreams have come true. The Ride with JMV on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. All right, let's get going on a Tuesday here. Where we're going to be Thursday and Friday and how you can win stuff, I'll tell you, coming up in just a bit as well. The latest regarding Anthony Richardson and concussion protocol. Uh, really nothing new here. And a lot of people have suggested, hey, I saw him last night at Westfield High School watching his little brother. I, I, I don't know what type of role that plays. I mean, maybe you can look at it as a bright side there, whatever. I, we'll know, I guess, when we see him or we don't see him in the latter portions of the week. And the same goes with Ryan Kelly moving forward at center. That's kind of been lost in the shuffle is the fact that Ryan Kelly is dealing with that as well. A couple of moves today they made. Uh, Hambright has been activated, brought up to the active roster, obviously, for what I just mentioned regarding Kelly. And uh, Trey Sermon is a running back that a lot of you had asked me about going back to the Philadelphia preseason game. And you'd asked me whether or not that would be a, an interesting signing. Actually, I, I take that back. Some of you had suggested they trade for him, and I said, nah, hold on. You, you don't need to trade for him because he's going to get cut here in about a week. And he ended up getting cut, and now practice squad worthy is he for the Colts, and we shall see if that has any bearing as far as, as moving forward as a backup running back, whether there's going to would be an effect, for example, on Deion Jackson and his status on this team moving forward. But again, as we talked about yesterday, I, I, I still think that you would be short-sighted in your thinking to believe that what they have right now in Moss is going to be enough and be satisfied with that. I don't know what's going to happen with Jonathan Taylor. I mean, I can expect to the next couple of weeks we're going to find something out. The NFL sent out that letter yesterday. Uh, and obviously, thinly, as thin as possible, veiled pointing of the finger at Jonathan Taylor and the way that he has been utilized on PUP. Still think that he needs to get back. Still believe at some point he's either going to get back or he's going to get traded, one of the two. But... With all due respect to the 88 yards and the nearly five per carry for Moss on Sunday, you still you still want that. And I know what type of season this team is in right now. I know what type of season that it's in. But as I mentioned with the Pacers last year, it's okay to win games during a rebuild or a reboot. In fact, it's good. Remember last year I got so sick and tired of hearing about all these entertaining losses and for the betterment of the team, to me, watching guys evolve. For example, watching this offense play at times the way that it did with two different quarterbacks, mind you. Even if it is against Houston, and Houston's not any good both sides of the football, it is good to see guys make plays, gain confidence, move forward. And if that comes with the win, then that comes with a win. I've said this before, I, I'm sick and tired of sitting around and talking about losers and talking about and having to hear about from a lot of people out there how great losing is, how beneficial losing is going to be. There's just been way too much of it, and I'm sick of it. So if you can win games along the way, win games along the way. We have to all be on the same page with that. I know we are with losing. Because basically, in and around this area has had one big fat L over the top of it for a number of years. And at some point, you have to say enough is enough. But even during a reboot, it is okay to see the satisfaction, the growth, the building of confidence of a team that you rebooted, a team that you rebuilt, a team that you follow that's going through that right now. To me, that can be, most of the time, even more important of, hey, where are you going to draft and how are you going to get Marvin Harrison Jr.? I mean, good luck with that good fortune. I would rather see you make strides and believers out of everybody around here that may be a non-believer. I would rather see that. We'll figure out how you can go about getting playmakers further down the road. First of all, we'll scream at those at the Colts and say playmakers a couple of different times, and maybe they will build upon that. But you can figure that out later. I would much rather this team figure out ways to be competitive and win with this roster right now. 
Now, granted, I look at what's coming up on Sunday, and I had Baltimore represented the AFC in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I know, I know. There could be a lot tougher teams out there, teams that could be going through the air a lot more, but I do like what the Ravens did in the offseason. What did they do? Well, they made sure they had Lamar Jackson back there. Through all that soap opera, the deal was done, and then they helped get him some other weapons. You know, drafting of Zay Flowers. And I don't know what good so far has done. I think three catches for Odell Beckham Jr. a week ago in their win in Cincinnati. But it's been addressed, and that had been an issue in Baltimore, much like, in fact, it has been an issue around here and still to many, including myself, is an issue around here. Is surrounding the talent that you have with more talent. That's been an issue there, and they tried to go out and do something about that in the offseason. As always, seemingly a really good defense. And so far, out of the gate at 2-0, it's been tough. Uh, Houston at home, Houston's no good. We saw that last weekend. Uh, Cincinnati on the road was a much bigger win. And, again, I know Cincinnati has historically, in recent history, started out slow. But this looks a little bit more awkward than it has with Joe Burrow and the show slow starts with this team. A little bit more awkward so far. Let's see if they're going to be able to dig out of that. So we can talk about that if you like to and obviously follow the story. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate you, my brother. The story of uh, what may or may not. Ooh, look, that's not even on me right now, is it? Is the camera back on me? I cannot rob you of my incredibly chiseled and handsome features right here. Got to have it on me. Inside the Lounge via YouTube Live, watch, brought to you by Wynn Schuler's Spreadable Cheeses. Uh, Indy's favorite spreadable cheeses. Wynn Schuler's a proud sponsor inside the Lounge via YouTube Live right there. Here's another point. I don't know about anybody else. And granted, I was coaching up a little bit. Instructing is what I was doing last night. Offensively instructing. That's what I was doing. And when I instructed on defense, it was, okay, if there's a high ball screen and the screener slips it and dives to the basket and you feel like you're out of position, thanks, Ken. I appreciate you, brother. That's Ken from Terre Haute. Go ahead and grab that jersey. I don't know. Is that right, James? Should I do that? So last night I instructed my girls. I said, hey, you know, when you get in on this high ball screen and and the screener slips the high ball screen and you feel like you're a little bit behind or out of position go ahead and tug on that jersey oh yeah that's That's okay yeah Yeah, so i thought it was okay i felt pretty good about it last night really good sound advice but anyway i I missed a large portion of the first game but i like the double dip on monday and i don't mind it one covering the other kind of gives you of a late game choice in one If you're not really down with the second game at the beginning, I think it gives you a choice. I don't know how you would describe both games last night. Probably not great. But at the same time, it's it's entertaining. It's football. And really, what else are you going to be watching on a Monday night besides that? Two and a half men. I think two and a half men's on uh, 333, I believe. And you're going to watch the Reds last night win another game against the Twins. I'm not going to bring anything up, Cubs fans, not at all. Not the standings, nothing. Zero. Not the latest. But I like the Monday night matchups when it's a double dip like that. And I think I like it even better when the two games kind of cover, like overlap one another. Am I wrong with that? Because they used to do it a different way. It used to be, all right, you'll start the early one early, and you'll probably have a West Coast game uh, at the end of the evening, and that thing's going to be late. I I like the overlapping going on there. The bummer about last night, and this is for those of you in the winner-take-all JMV show, the bar restock from Heaven Hill Distillery. (laughs) I was telling James, I don't think James realized this, Uh, I was telling James how I lost, and it's funny. You can lose in fantasy in a variety of ways, and I don't know if it's just me and my dumb luck, my bad luck, my misfortune, or what. So I lose in the most reprehensible way possible last night. I had basically a quarter and a half to cruise. 
Pickens and Njoku, either team, at some point, all I needed was a stinking catch. I needed a completion to one of them, and Pickens went off last night. But at that point, as soon as I turned it over, and this is why sometimes I don't watch the Reds, because I am slep rock. I am such bad luck. I'm a jinx. Sometimes I'll turn it over, and the Reds are doing great. They'll be up five runs, and the pitching is great, and I'll start watching. And it's like when Billy Bean and Moneyball watched that 21st game. Remember, they were going for 21 in a row against the Royals? And he went against his philosophy of not watching, and he turned it on. I think in the fourth inning, they were up 11 to nothing. So he doubled back. Goes to the game, and all of a sudden, things start falling apart. The Royals start coming back, start building their way back, ultimately tying the game once he got there to watch. That's exactly how I feel when I watch the Reds. Almost every time when I turn them on, they're going great, and then I turn them on, and they go awful. So I realize that I'm a little bit of a jinx, and that's what happened last night. I mean, Pickens was tearing it up. I mean, really, the only offense that the Steelers had last night was picking – or pick it to pick ins uh, for most of that game. And then once I turned it on, it stopped. I needed Njoku, the tight end of the Browns. I needed a reception, and that was about it. And then James had nothing else to play. Boom, I get over. I get that reception. But no, no, no. In the true jinx scenario that I am, I had to have a reception and then a fumble. So I made some ground with points, and then the fumble – The lost fumble takes it away, so I am less than a point behind, and that's how I end up losing. Because, honestly, they didn't look at him again after that. (laughs) I go, God, you got to be kidding me. Like, everything was going great. I'm a half a point away. Everything was fantastic, and then that happened. You get the reception that puts you over the top, and then the fumble loss that brings you back. And that part really does suck. And that's what happens. And I I think sometimes that's what I am. Just incredible misfortune that I am right there. Pretty sad. Larceny Bourbon Locks, Luna Azul Tequila shots coming at you this week. We're going to be at Joe's Grill in Fishers coming up on Thursday, 3 until 6. Me, betting analyst Brent Halverson. And a host of others. We're going to have the samples to give away. Have a really good time for that. So that's on Thursday. Larceny Bourbon Locks. Luna Azul Tequila Shots. Again, Joe's Grill in Fishers. I think it was mentioned Friday that we were going to be in Westfield. But this is Joe's Grill Fishers coming up on Thursday. Bud Light Blue Friday has Rams Colts tickets to give away. We're downtown here at Kilroy's. I would love to see you for that. Again, Rams, Colts tickets to give away coming up on Friday. That is a Bud Light Blue Friday with this show, and we're already going into week number three, which seems absolutely incredible and awesome at the same time it does. So, (laughs) I gotta admit, I can get brought into it with a lot of conversation and a lot of talk, a lot of Jack John, if you will. Can you imagine for a moment, and I know this was over 48 hours ago and probably nobody cares, but collegiately speaking, right? Just thinking about that for a moment. Didn't all the talk kind of bring you in for Colorado and Colorado State? Can you imagine the level of I don't give a crap whatsoever we would have had without the talk? And really both coaches. Because Deion Sanders brought it out in Jay Norvell, and then they both brought it out with one another, and then we saw that transform on the field. Listen, I am not after dudes cheap-shotting other dudes, and I hate it for that Hunter kid. But I'm going to tell you this. Sometimes situations like that bring us to a spot to where you're glad you heard it. And with a team that a lot of people suggest in Colorado from head coach on down, rarely if ever take the high road, this Hunter kid yesterday took the high road. Said, you know what That's what football is all about? I'm going to miss four weeks. I'm going to miss four weeks. And then people were talking about how the Colorado State kid needs to have his scholarship taken away and needs to miss as much time as Hunter misses. And rarely do we see it. 
the high road at that level taken because, I mean, that dude could have piled on absolutely everybody and been celebrated for the next four weeks. You know, especially if Colorado goes to Oregon and loses by virtue of not having his availability. But he talked about how, you know, that's just what happens sometimes. And and believe me, cheap shots should not be a part of football. But you're never going to completely be able to eliminate things like that, much like you're never going to be able to eliminate. And there's a difference between recklessness and playing the way this offense is designed. Like People are asking me all the time about Anthony Richardson. What are you going to do about his running? You can't do it as much. I'm all for You have to make the blanket statement he has to better protect himself. And how do you do that? That's going to have to be learned. Why? Because he's never really had to do that before. He's the one laying the wood in the past. He's the one that's coming for you in the past, and now everybody's coming for him. And it doesn't matter who you are, who you are defensively on that roster. If you're a 300-plus defensive lineman, if you're a 260-pound, incredibly athletic and strong and fast linebacker or you're a defensive back at some point when you're out running around as a quarterback you are going to pay just gonna pay and i know that you don't want this dude to miss time i don't want him to miss time but to suggest that they're going to have some sort of a short-term at best overhaul offensively to consider this they knew exactly what they were getting into when they made this draft selection. In fact, when Shane Steichen fell in love with Anthony Richardson, it was part of that being a very large reason as to why he was so compelled that that was the future quarterback and should have been the selection at number four overall. That's why. And this is not going to go away. And we'll probably be back at this point one of these days. And really, and, it, and I brought this up yesterday regarding luck. I, I mean, could you slide? And was he a good slider? Absolutely not. No. I mean, when you look back in hindsight, do you wish that he had done it differently at some points? Yes. And maybe this is something now that is going to be learned by this kid at the age of 21 moving forward. But again, to completely eliminate it like hunter said yesterday that that's just football that's football that's the way he plays that's the way this team is going to play offensively so you're going to have to live with these situations i always said this goes back to the manning era and this is nothing against sorgi man sorgi is a good ass dude but i'd always said this I always said during the Manning era, and I'm talking about the winning games, playing to go to Super Bowls, high highest bar ever, elite level type of stuff we're talking about. Bill Polian never really chose to go out there and to get a tested and a higher level, credible backup quarterback. And then obviously with the next situation, ultimately, you know, you had to go out and get Kerry Collins, and then it all fell through. And you ended up getting rid of Manning and drafted Andrew Luck. But to me, that was different. I mean, to me, Manning Manning was established. Manning was going to throw. Manning had the players and the team around him. Manning didn't get out there and put himself in harm's way. That's how they played offense. And that is a 180 compared to how this team's going to play offense. Again, you could put out those disclaimers and you could print out a log or two if you want maybe a couple of scrolls on things that you need to do better in terms of protecting yourself during live action out there but this is going to happen last week wasn't the first time or i should say last week was the first time this past week wasn't the first time and this past week sure as hell is not going to be the last time we're just gonna have to deal with this you know, one of these days, hopefully you evolve into a much better, bigger presence in the pocket as a pocket passer, the accuracy, the ball placement, whatever. Maybe one of these days, that's what you are. But what you are right now is you're a multifaceted quarterback. That's why they drafted you. 
That's the type of offense they have built around you. And that's that. I don't know what more you're going to be able to do about it. You could cross your fingers, hope for good fortune, which rarely has been around this place in the past. And do something like that. Man, I was really bummed. I love this. I don't know how many of you ended up watching Winning Time. And I know some were bent out of shape because you, you felt that you know, the characters were, were overblown, you know, not traditionally accurate. And I know that Jerry West was somebody that was outspoken, you know, about wanting to make sure people understood that's not how he was, Jason Clark was the actor that played the role in Winning Time of Jerry West. And, you know, I understand to be 100% accurate, that's great. But also, also there are times to where you just kind of want to be entertained. I mean, if, if there was a situation like, for example, with Rudy, I like watching Rudy. I like watching Rudy at the end, and I know it's not 100% accurate, but I just watch it in terms of the entertainment value. Same can be said regarding Hoosiers. There are some things in that that certainly are not quite accurate, but I choose to watch that and enjoy it because of the entertainment value. And I know that that varies. But with me, winning time, winning time was fun as hell to watch. You know how much I love basketball. You know how much I love that era. And, you know, whether or not some situations were correct and others were just completely overblown and outdone and not even close, what that series did for two seasons is incredibly entertaining. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I especially loved it when they informed you that this actually happened. So Larry Bird did work out at Indiana State against his future Sycamore teammates while wearing jeans. Now, he wasn't wearing work boots as he was in that particular moment of season two of winning time. But he did play pickup in jeans, which is so Southern Indiana is awesome. And not only played pickup in jeans, but killed everybody playing pickup in jeans. Yeah, normally the guy in jeans playing pickup is not really doing anything that dramatic, that spectacular, that productive, except being pointed at about the dude wearing jeans. But no, that really happened. I loved it when they did that. And then there was kind of that that suspension of reality here to where you just kind of got to think, all right, you think that's accurate? Did that really happen? The Pat Riley scene in the locker room when he finally just said, hey, will you guys shut the blank up and started individually telling guys off, put it to guys individually as it was, Michael Cooper, Kareem, Magic Johnson, Norm Nixon. It was just, it to me, and I, I know this, I, I love the era. I love the era of basketball. And certainly it was a springboard to even more. I, I just, I feel like now, and I hope, that another streaming service is able to pick it up because there seems like that there is so much more on the table. And, I mean, the Pacers had a couple of instances there. Jack McKinney, you know, that game that game here, if you remember, right, was it the the game with Bird here? And the girl flashed or something like that. And I'm sure that didn't happen, but it was awesome. Absolutely awesome. And those were the bad old days, by the way, of the Pacers. That's when you came out to watch. I remember coming here in 1982, which had been the, the curtain years that, that winning time was talking about, coming up to Marcus Square Arena and watching the Pacers and the Lakers. And Kareem, Kareem played in low-top canvas Adidas. I mean, really, for Adidas, that would have been one step above Kmart tracks. If you remember Kmart tracks, if you ever had parents that said, hey, you know what? You don't need those Adidas. You don't need that Nike. We're going to get you these Kmart tracks because they're on a blue light special. And while that was really fundamentally financially sound for your parents, if they did that, when you went to school, it wasn't great for you. It wasn't great for you. 
But it was just basically the shoes he had on canvas. They were canvas Adidas low top. I mean, it looked like he was playing in slippers. I mean, he was barely there, and rarely did he ever cross half court because he didn't feel it necessary against the Pacers. You know, a lot of the surliness and the way that he played during that time, again, historically speaking, was accurate. But, man, that was a great show. I hope somebody picks it up. And I know a lot of you were watching it because I had talked about it, and it was unfortunate to see. You could kind of tell if you were watching the season two finale when they started going over, you know, things that were happening in the future. And you could tell that they were tying things up and wrapping things up, and that's unfortunate. Great show it was. Winning time, three seasons on HBO. Check that, two seasons on HBO, and we'll see if another streaming service could maybe pick up and uh, put that thing back together again for a season number three. We shall see. Greg Rakestraw is going to join me coming up at the bottom of the hour from PFF. Brad Spielberger is going to join us at four today. Matt Taylor, voice of the Colts, 430. Bob Kravitz, of course, the Bob Kravitz column is going to join us coming up at the 5 o'clock hour, and he addresses the situation regarding Anthony Richardson and injuries. Bob joins us coming up at the 5 o'clock hour. Adam Sandler tickets for that show at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. That is coming up in November. Somebody's going to win Sandler tickets a little bit later on as well. 239-1070. Email address jam via 1075thefan.com. Inside the lounge via YouTube Live. And you got us on the stream, the app, HD Radio. And coming back with you and Greg Rakestraw on 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan.
Just dude. 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Oh, thank you for joining us. Brad Spielberger, PFF, going to be here coming up in the 4 o'clock hour. My advice is for you to join us. Got Sandler tickets coming up, too. No, I don't want this to see what happened here. Sometimes I grab this Wi-Fi brick that I have, and I accidentally turn it off. Like I grab it, and like the on-off button's right there. I screwed that up. My bad. Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline right now. Uh, the fifth quarter huddle, he's a part of that. High school football every week, probably something or other every week. Uh, Indy 11 as well. Greg Rakestraw is with us. So um, by now, should we all be close to um, as getting uh, some kind of license a- as a physician and as a doctor uh, dealing with <laughs> a Skulls team? Are we, are we anywhere near that right now, Greg? Um, I'm sure 31 of the markets feel the exact same way. I'm sure Houston is lamenting their lack of offensive linemen. The Browns are lamenting their lack of a running back. And we uh, are now concussion experts yeah. uh, with, with, with a running quarterback. So that's just life in the National Football League, my friend. If you um, if you were a wagering fella, would you wager participation from Richardson Sunday or deactivation from Richardson Sunday? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure I'd be wagering just yet. I think I'd wait to kind of see how things play out Wednesday or Thursday. So right. cause I really think it's it's 50-50. You know, I think the signs so far tend to point in the right direction. Uh, I could also see the Indianapolis Colts erring on the side of caution, given the team in which they are playing in terms of the Baltimore Ravens. So uh, I, I think his status in terms of practice tomorrow and Thursday, and just kind of the general attitude about him practicing uh, tomorrow is going to tell us a great deal as to whether he's playing on Sunday or not. Do you think this is a cautionary tale? How do you view this game in terms of, hey, uh, we know what the Colts are, we know what the Ravens are so far. Where do you place that as far as prioritizing whether or not you believe he should play? Um, Again, if he's healthy, play him. Because he figures you have to learn. Uh, everything for him is about getting experience, and, you know, that experience was shortened uh, against the Houston Texans. Now, are the Houston Texans probably one of the worst teams they're going to play this year? Yeah, probably. Uh, but it's still much-needed game experience for a guy that, as we have well documented, started all of 13 games at the University of Florida. So um, for him to make the progress that everybody hopes that he is going to make, um, you got to play against the, the, the best teams. Uh, and so I, I think it really comes down to if he's healthy – He's playing on Sunday, and if not, he won't. As simple as that. It's uh, Greg Rakestraw who joins us via the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. The Colts fifth quarter huddle. That is the post game show with he and Bill Brooks again coming at you on Sunday after the Ravens Colts matchup in Baltimore. I mentioned I thought the most important, and it was just getting up off the mat in terms of the running game was Zach Moss on Sunday and that win over Houston. Where would you point the finger at? This was something that was most important in the grand scheme of that particular win. Well, it's huge. I mean, let's face it, the offensive line blocked better. And again, they were not facing the caliber of defensive line that they did in week number one. But I thought Zach Moss did a great job of finishing off runs. The other thing that I would say, I'm not sure that, that you know, 18 carries for 88 yards and a touchdown needed further explanation after 16 carries for 25 yards from the running back position. But most of Moss's carries came after Anthony Richardson left the game. And in other words, if it's a running play, defense is focused on number 21. They're not having to look at the quarterback because Gardner Minshew can move in the pocket to keep a play going. They're not going to call many design runs for Gardner Minshew. Or on the run pass option, uh, it's it's not going to be the quarterback keeper. It's going to be hand the ball to Moss. So, Zach Moss was a wonderful addition for the Indianapolis Colts from week one to week two. But again, much like every, almost every other aspect of this game, business is going to pick up. You know, Baltimore is, is because the Colts' schedule isn't terribly difficult, it's one of the best teams the Colts are going to play all year. Uh, and so we will learn a lot more about this football team, including the running game, come Sunday afternoon. What are we learning about the uh, two collegiate teams most followed around here, being Purdue and Indiana, uh, most of which I'm assuming the fan base is collectively didn't really want to know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think almost now we're hopeful that those two teams at least have five wins when they play each other in the bucket game on Thanksgiving weekend. It is possible that 
Both teams know it's their last game of the season, meaning they've got four or less wins going into it. Um, you know, Purdue's in a different place than Indiana, uh, but I also do think there is a little more grace for Purdue just because of the fact that it is a, a new head coach and a new head coaching staff and a schedule. While Purdue's has, has been easier because of geography than Indiana's has in most years, that is not the case this year. And so – who do I think is the better football team right now? I think Purdue is. It doesn't mean Indiana can't beat Purdue, but I think Purdue is generally the better football team. Who was the – yeah. go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Who was the most disappointing? You, you said in terms of a little more of a grace period with a new head coach in West Lafayette and then obviously Tom Allen, but the shortcomings, the major shortcomings with that team, who, who are you more disappointed with with this start? I'm not, it, it's hard for me to say just because I think big picture I'm more disappointed in Indiana – just because of what the last two years have been like after that seemingly what was like a comet in 2020. You know, the, the, the season and, and the way that results happened in beating Penn State and beating Michigan and being competitive with Ohio State, and that just hasn't been replicated. Other And, and throw the Wisconsin win in, in that season, too, and that just hasn't been replicated other than a six- or seven-week window where nobody could actually go to the game to watch the team play. Um, and so I, I would say this, John, I default to always having more expectations for Purdue than I do Indiana, but I guess maybe I'm more disappointed that Indiana 2023 looks a lot like Indiana 2021 and 2022. Notre Dame, Ohio State is a big one coming up this weekend. Without question, size up that matchup and the expectation coming up on Saturday night. Let's face it, you know, Notre Dame has kind of established themselves as being, you know, largely good enough to be in the conversation, but it almost is like, hey, there's almost been like a ceiling. Like now the expectation is Notre Dame can be a top five, top ten team, but we're not sure if they're truly a college football playoff team or a top two team. Um, maybe this is the year where that's not the case. Now, their upcoming schedule obviously gets tougher. They're going to play the best teams on their schedule over the course of the next few weeks. But I would say in most years, even with as solid as Notre Dame has been, you would say Ohio State is clearly the better team. I'm not sure that's the case this year. So there's a little bit more of weight of expectations on Notre Dame in this game, but I also think they're the more experienced team, and obviously that is the case, the quarterback position. So I realize they play sporadically and not every year. But let's just say they have been playing every year for the last 10 or 15. This is one of the few times that Notre Dame would be the favorite. Let's see how they handle that coming up on Saturday. High school football last week, I think, put it into week number five. We're halfway through it right now. Give me some standouts. You know, Center Grove and, and Ben Davis, you know, are, I think are really good. Uh, and obviously they both have losses to kind of national-level powerhouses from outside of the state of Indiana. So Brownsburg, you know, when, when the polls came out today, is rated number one, and, and that's, that's a really good team. Again, the HCC as a conference is, is fantastic from top to bottom, knowing that HSC and Brownsburg don't play each other uh, until the end of the season. Um, you know, that's shaping up already as a Week 9 showdown. Um, but Center Grove and, and, and Ben Davis, I think, are really solid, too. I would say this. This is now the 11th fall that we have had six classifications. And I think this is the deepest that 6A has been. There have been a couple of years where there has been parity, where there has not been a great team per se. Like I think of, you know, the, the state finals run, you know, when, when, when Taven Jackson and uh, Caden Curry, those guys were underclassmen. It was kind of a surprise where Senator Grove was four and five in the regular season. Carson Steele missed a lot of that season, but they made the state finals and Carmel beat them. That was the year where there was parity. There, there is parity this year, but it's at a higher level. I think there are, um, there are simply a larger number of really good teams in 6A than we've ever had before. How do you view 5A? Because it kind of gets lost in the shuffle between both 6 and 4A, in particular this season, Greg. Well, and, and to be blunt, there's not a lot of Indianapolis schools in 5A. Right. That's part of it. Right. Um, you know, having seen Fort Wayne Snyder, they're really good. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe we should have given Warren a little more of a curve uh, because Warren nearly knocked off Ben Davis last week. And the team that I saw from Warren in week one would not have been close to the team I saw from Ben Davis in week three and weeks four. But they were talented but young in, in a lot of key positions. Unfortunately, Warren lost their quarterback with an arm injury last week. So we'll see how, what sort of effect that has on them 
uh, over the next you know few weeks of the season. I'll see them back to back weeks in week seven and week eight. But Snyder is good. Scott Bless, his team at Bloomington North, is having a phenomenal start to the season. Yeah. They are 5-0. and oh, uh, But 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 5A has become kind of wide open because, you know, New Pal had played in 5A for a few years. They have now dropped back down to 4A. Cathedral had played in, in 5A for a few years. They have bumped up to 6A. Whiteland had a, a, a tremendous class of players last year. They don't have a, a similar group this year. Maybe Decatur Central can make a late run. But the 5A schools around here, seemingly they're kind of beating each other up a little bit. Um, I think it's, it's going to be Fort Wayne Snyder from the north. Maybe Valpo, Merrillville could, could knock them off like they did last year. It was Valpo that got them in the semi-state. I think the 5A south is wide open. Let's see if, if Scott Bless's team uh, can, can, A, get past south in their own sectional, but then make a run after that in terms of the 5A Southern bracket. Is it fair to say, and I, I don't want to come across as you know making a, a swipe, but is it fair to say that you could put 4A up against 5A in, in terms of the top of the rankings right there and probably be okay? Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, again, I, I think Snyder is really good. Uh, I, I think, again, having seen them and knowing – how many 6A schools they play. You know, they, they scheduled Warren Central. They scheduled an East Noble in week number two. But they play three 6A schools in Fort Wayne. So they play Homestead. They play Carroll. And Carroll's really good this year. I think Northrop is the other 6A uh, of that bunch. Um, they're going to play a, as good of a schedule as anybody in 5A would. So I would probably put Snyder above that. Now you get East Central, Wrights, Kokomo, those guys could easily hang with most of the schools in the 5A classification. Snyder's the one that I would separate from that group. So Greg Rakestraw with us via the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. Before I let you go, what are you up to besides the fifth quarter huddle after the Colts game Sunday? So I've got Friday night football, and I'm doing something different. I'll be hitting the Redneck Autobahn on Friday night. The folks on folks in Washington have a brand-new Hatchet Hollow, a brand-new stadium, really for the first time in about 80 years. Uh, turf new stands, new press box, everything. And they have invited us as ISC to come televise slash stream their rededication game, their big homecoming game against Pike Central. So we as ISC will have Carmel and North Central on Channel 23 this week. We'll have Ben Davis and Lawrence North available on ISC pay-per-view as well. We're also going to have Washington Pike Central. So that's the game that I have on Friday night. And then, John, believe it or not, on Saturday – I'm taking a day off. It's my wife's birthday. Oh, well, so, happy so, birthday to Amy. And thankfully, all of like my college football partners and the Indy 11 also have the day off or don't need my services. So it made that a very easy decision. The other thing that I'm going to tell you I'm doing on Saturday, and you know this gentleman quite well, um, I'm supporting my buddy J.J. DeBross. Yes. He has had the Count Up for Cat event at Hinkle Fieldhouse. Yep. That scholarship, which was started 18 years ago, has raised seven hundred thousand dollars for butler university this is the last year they're going to keep funding the scholarship but it's largely endowed at this point uh and so with that they're going to have a final free throw shooting competition uh at hinkle field house and since i had been a part of so many of them i was invited to come back and take part in the last one so i'll be bricking free throws and like john yelling short when i know it's not going to make it up there uh, Saturday morning at Hinkle Fieldhouse. Looking forward to that, too. My man, I appreciate that. We'll be looking forward to a, a namey birthday call on the JMV Takeover Saturday in night. Fact, in fact, how about I don't call the show? Yes. But for Amy's birthday, I have her call the show. How think, about that? Yep. Fantastic. Tell her something from the 80s. We go back to the 80s on Saturday. Well, we are both of the 80s, so I think we'll figure it out. That's perfectly fine. Got it, buddy. Appreciate you. See ya. Uh, Greg Rakestraw via the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. Brad Spielberg, you guys got any PFF questions, any nerdery stuff that maybe is bouncing around in your head you want to clarify? Uh, we'll go through the first couple of weeks of the season with Brad coming up here in the 4 o'clock hour. Matt Taylor, voice of the Colts, and also much like me, a big Reds fan. At the very least, at the very least, who thought that we could be entertained by a playoff push in mid-September from this Reds team. I didn't. I did not, and I'm guessing that most of you as a Reds fan didn't either. So, hey, I'm going to soak this up right now in the final couple of weeks of the season. 
Yeah, I know. Somebody said, did you hear what they were saying about Votto this morning on the morning wake-up call? Well, I can tell you this. It sure as hell was not Kevin Bowen because Kevin Bowen, much like me, is a Reds fan. So it was the Swebo, the sweet part of Swebo, I think. And then Dyke was Dyketon in on that? Dyketon's a Cubs fan. I think Dyketon has talked a bunch of junk about the Reds, and now Dyketon has to sit and wallow in it because you talk all that junk, and this is what happens. All of a sudden, the Cubs fall off the pace as of right now. You don't want to be that guy. But, yeah, I don't want to hear the anti Votto stuff. Votto has been a pleasure for me as a Reds fan to watch, to hear, and to thoroughly enjoy, even if there was not a lot of winning. I certainly blame the lack of winning on other folks within that organization and not Votto and not Votto's contract. Quick break, and we'll come back. Bob Kravitz also on the 5 o'clock hour. Don't go anywhere inside the lounge via YouTube Live as well. 93.5 and 107.5.
97.5, The Fan. Hi, Brad Spielberger, PFF, going to join us coming up in the 4 o'clock hour. Matt Taylor, voice of the Colts, going to be here at 4.30. Bob Kravitz, 5. He's got a column regarding uh, the uh, Anthony Richardson concussion situation. And I, I know everybody's talking about it. Everybody's writing about it. Um, and I think we're all probably, to a degree, saying about the same thing. But it is accurate. We'll talk to Bob about that coming up in the 5 o'clock hour. Keith, before the top of the hour at 239-1070, is up first today. Hello, Keith. Uh, first of all, our Reds are going to make the playoffs. The Cubs won't be. So, I, I love – I don't know what's going to throw me more. The Reds make it or the Cubs screw themselves out of it. It, it both really is exciting me on both angles right here. Okay, I want to remind Greg Ristrader that Tavon Jackson is right now second in the Big Ten and past completion percentages at 72%. Yeah. And number three, <laughs> number three okay. the Colts secondary better tighten up because we're in trouble. 385 yards passing against a bump mass Houston, that's got to get better. What else you got there, Keith? Those are three really strong takes so far. You got a fourth? Yeah. Indiana State will beat Michigan State in the rematch of 79 come December. No, oh, hold on a second. That's going to give me a bit of a sports arousal here, Keith, before the top of the hour. That's strong. That's a way to go out with me. That's a way to go out. <laughs> what did he call? He called Greg Re- Regstrader. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. Quick break. Brad Spielberger, top of the hour, PFF. All you need to know through the first two weeks of the season, a lot of these numbers regarding the Colts and then some next.
107.5, The Fan. Uh, inside the lounge via YouTube Live, I think it was Hoosier that said, uh, JMV, typical Reds fan bum, more worried about the Cubs and cards than his own team. Hey, let's make sure the record reflects this accurately. I knew all season long through the long haul what I expected out of the Reds, but about a month ago, and some of you clown Cubs fans know exactly who you are, decided to open your yaps. Now, the, the Cardinals are different, and, and I've said this before. The Cardinals are going to get end up getting me back. Final series of the season, I can see this coming a mile away, so I'm going to pay the price for that. But I am not going to own this Cubs crap because you clowns started that. Maybe not all of you, but some of you. And now you kind of got to live with it a little bit. Still a chance there, but now you got to live with it. That's on you. That's not on me. About a month ago, everybody's calling their shot. Hey, look at us. And you know what? Your team's not good enough to do that, so now you're paying the price. That's why I'm hesitant to do that with the Reds. I know that they're not good enough to do that. And, hell, I just celebrated those little victories over the course of the season, like June. But, now nah, this is all on you guys. It's on you. And not all of you. I know all Cubs fans aren't made the same, but a lot of you are clowns. And about a month ago, I remember I could play back some tape if you guys want. What do you call it? Keeping receipts? I've kept receipts. I don't have any receipts. So now, Hoosier, inside the lounge, that's on you. That's a you fault and a you problem, not a me problem. Now, we'll see. Now, I'm going to have to own the one with the Cardinals because, again, I can see this coming a mile away, and I predicted it months ago when everything was going great in June. Well, you can watch this Reds team being at the end, and I'm making fun of the Cardinals. Bad season. Ha, that's funny. And I'm going to have to pay that price coming up, too. Hey, we all do. You all, We all do. When you talk junk about a team that is not as le- legit as you believe it to be, you're going to end up paying for that. I'm going to have to own it. Cubs fans are owning it right now because you were in a good spot. Now you're not. Get back to that coming up in a minute. Yeah, discuss that amongst yourselves inside the lounge via YouTube Live. Brought to you by Win Schuler's Spreadable Cheeses, the favorite spreadable cheese in India, and the official spreadable cheese sponsor of the lounge via YouTube Live. Andy Moore, Automotive Group Hotline. Brad Spielberger of PFF joins us. I'm going to ask you this first, um, and not that this is a, a big deal, but I like the overlapping of the double dip NFL wise on Monday night. Do you? Yeah, you know, I do. I, I saw a lot of complaints about it. Uh, I have a two-screen household here, so uh, I'm able to watch both games simultaneously. And for me, more football is always good. You know, I'm not going to complain about more football. No, and I like the way that it overlaps. I do. I mean, like, we, we're used to in the past at the start of the season, right? You get a double dip, you know, East Coast one and then a West Coast one. But I like the way that these these overlap. I enjoy it. Yeah, especially with a little bit of a stagger still to where, you know, I remember last night the Panthers, uh, Saints were going into halftime. The Brown Steelers still had, I don't know, 10 minutes left in the second quarter. And then when that came into halftime, the, you know, the Panthers Saints were back on. So it was nonstop action. We have seen Frank Reich around here before. Uh, would you consider the start of this season offensively and some of the questions being lobbed his direction in Charlotte? Would you consider that a Frank Reich offensive issue problem when they ask him whether or not he should still be calling the plays? Because we saw that here and wondered that here, and now you see it again. It's only two weeks, but you see it in Charlotte. Is that a Reich problem? You know, I, I will say I'm not super surprised so far with the lack of their receivers to create separation. You know, I think coming into the year, they probably had the worst weaponry in the NFL or certainly on the short list there. I am really, really surprised that Bryce Young looks more lost than Anthony Richardson um, and certainly C.J. Stroud. You know, regardless of what I thought about those guys long term, I thought coming into their rookie seasons, we would see a, a Bryce Young that we saw at Alabama that was so poised, so calm, so confident. I think it's still there to a degree, but but kind of looks like a deer in headlights sometimes. Yes, he played against two very good defenses the first two weeks. Um, you know, I think Atlanta's unit's a lot better than it was last year, 
But, uh, you know, th- that probably does go back to Reich and, and Caldwell and, and the veterans in that building that, that have helped a lot of young quarterbacks. I've been surprised how out of sorts he's looked. So Brad Spielberger, PFF, via the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. All right, what'd you make of the Colts over the weekend? Now, I know this, Houston collectively, not any good. But you take a win whenever you can get it. And the Anthony Richardson situation, concussion, concussion protocol, enter Gardner Minshew. I guess what I would ask you first, what are your thoughts on the Steichen offense in the first two weeks of the season, calling the plays and being a first-time head coach? I think he looks great. You know, I think he saw that he clearly knew what he was doing in Philadelphia. Nick Sirianni, you know, passes over play calling duties. Second called plays of the Chargers during Herbert's rookie season as well. Uh, obviously, you know, won the rookie of the year, had, you know, most touchdowns ever for a rookie quarterback. So, you know, look, still some things to work out. Obviously, maybe you don't want to expose Richardson as much, although I really don't think they've been running him too often. You know, kind of a fluky concussion right at the goal line with a safety that I think in college, Richardson probably beats that safety to the pylon by five yards and just has to recognize he's now playing in the NFL. But I really like what I've seen. I think you also saw, which is very, very hard to do, the script flip when Minshew comes in, super low average depth of target. You're getting Josh Downs a lot of work over the middle and just letting guys create in space. Uh, whereas it was more kind of shots and, uh, you know, Richardson throwing downfield obviously has a cannon of an arm. Uh, I think Steichen's been great. I'm going to ask you this. And again, you've got the reflection of three quarters of play to make this comparison, because a lot of people have suggested, you know what, this team, you want to see Richardson get used to things, get acclimated and grow, but it's in this case, Menchu that gives this team this offense a better chance to be more productive, especially where it stands right now. Is that your belief? I mean, you probably could make the argument. You know, I think Minshew is one of the better backups across the NFL. You know, I just mentioned Philadelphia. Minshew comes in last year against the Dallas Cowboys when Jalen Hurts gets hurt um, and put up, what, like 30-something points, you know, on Christmas Eve uh, in that game against one of the best defenses in the NFL. So, you know, you're comparing a rookie who's made 13 college starts and now one and a half NFL starts to a seasoned veteran that is going to just sit back, trust his offensive line. And like I said, he had a six yard average depth of target. He didn't push the ball downfield much at all, you know, but they were, they had a lead at that point that they, they could play relatively safe. You know, while I think you can make the argument, the ceiling is obviously astronomically higher with Anthony Richardson and you have to let him learn, let him grow, let him make those mistakes, let him miss. You know, I, I, there, was a, there was a play where Alec Pierce was wide open for a walk-in 60-yard touchdown at one point that I think Richardson will see with more time. You, you have to give him that time. So Brad Spielberger, PFF with us via the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. All right, the competition for the Colts is Baltimore. The Ravens 2-0, and wins over Houston, and, and then really helping again shut down and send Cincinnati to an 0-2 start within now – Uh, the AFC North. What's impressed you at the beginning, both sides of the football, with this 2-0 start in Baltimore? Yeah, they deserve a ton of credit for this past week in particular against Cincinnati. I know the Bengals are out of sorts, but they come into this game. They're missing Marlon Humphrey, their number one corner. Marcus Williams, their number one safety. Uh, And defensive coordinator Mike McDonald has just owned Joe Burrow and the Bengals the last three times they've played now. uh, I guess four times because they played in the playoffs last year as well. Um, and missing all those guys, he had a bunch of simulated pressures. I think that is going to throw either quarterback that plays in this game for a loop, meaning, you know, you're showing seven guys the line. You have no clue who's actually rushing, who's going to drop back in coverage. I think he's been phenomenal there. A lot of stunts up front as well. You know, so getting, creating rushing lanes for his pass rush, which I think is like an at league average unit. They have talent. They have some good young players, but it's not, you know, a, a loaded Baltimore Ravens defensive line like we've seen. So the defense has been coached phenomenally, certainly has talent, but, but even better. And the flip side of the offense, without left tackle Ronnie Stanley last week, without center Tyler Lindebaum last week, probably their two best offensive linemen. Offensive coordinator Todd Munkin, in a new hire this offseason, has really unlocked Lamar Jackson. I mean, he has been phenomenal, phenomenal. He had a bunch of incredible throws. The deep ball to Zay Flowers down the left seam was an absolute dart at a couple of the really nice plays. I thought we'd see a little bit more time before the offense gelled to this level. They are already off and flying. Has Dobbins now being done for the season, and obviously I think it was half of the first game and then all of the week two win in Cincinnati, 
what has been the effect with Gus Edwards now taking over? And it, what are the, what's the delicate balance, I guess, offensively between running and having Lamar Jackson still utilize that skill set that he has compared to now throwing the football out there because of the offseason, they go out there and replenish. They go out there and get some skill position guys. What's been that dynamic through the first two weeks of the season with that in mind offensively? Yeah, so the beauty of having Lamar Jackson in an offense, and we're going to see it in Indianapolis as well with Anthony Richardson, is the gravity that he has in the run game. It makes it a, a running back's dream to play in that offense because opposing defenses probably need to keep a spy, a linebacker, or safety, whatever, or a defensive lineman that is really just keyed in on, I'm the guy who's supposed to set the edge, not let Lamar Jackson get outside of me. I kind of should just ignore everything else. And obviously when you do that, it maybe takes a player out of the box or, or just takes a player out of a certain gap in the run fit and there and that therefore creates lanes for the Ravens running back. So, look, I think with losing Dobbins, you lose explosiveness. You lose a guy that can break off 30, 40-yard rushes that Gus Edwards just really can't do. But he's still going to average five, six yards a carry. Um, you know, it might be five, six yards in a cloud of dust almost every time, but he's going to have effective rushes um, because of how hard it is to defend this offense. All right, Brad, I do want to talk about their defense. I mean, normally it's a defense that gets after the quarterback, plays you physically. Are they upholding what we know that Ravens defense to be in the first two weeks of the season? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, like I said, down a couple of really, really important players, highly paid players. Um, they, they've been great, you know, and, and coming into this season, my biggest question mark was, you have third-year edge rusher Odafe Owe, uh, you know, second-year guy David Ajabo from Michigan who tore his Achilles last year, so kind of didn't really play as a rookie. Both of those guys look pretty good. Justin Matabuike on the interior is a fourth-year player on a rookie deal. You know, Travis Jones, a third-round pick last year. Like, I'm going through all these names, and we're used to the Justin Houstons and Calais Campbells and all these wily veterans. They handed over the keys to a bunch of young guys that certainly are, you know, can still get better, but – but that front, and then obviously, you know, one of the best linebacking duos in the NFL, maybe the best, with Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen, yeah, they've been fast, physical, they swarm the football, um, but also McDonald has just been really confusing opposing quarterbacks. I mentioned the simulated pressures. They also love to rotate coverage. So pre-snap, they'll show a certain look, and they'll rotate out of it post-snap, and that, that had Joe Burrow in a bind all afternoon. I want to look back to Sunday, if you don't mind, within the AFC South. Was Jacksonville in single digits offensive output and that loss to the Chiefs at home more about the Chiefs being the Chiefs or Jacksonville not nearly as good what people would talk about them being entering the season? No, I think for them, the offensive line, you know, with Cam Robinson getting suspended, you have to reshuffle the entire line. You have a rookie in Anton Harrison out of Oklahoma, who I did really like, but you know, younger player, I want to say he's 20, 20 years old on draft night, probably 21 now, and a guy that probably shouldn't have started right out of the gate, but, but kind of was forced to because of the suspensions. They've had injuries to the interior as well. Brandon Sheriff's been hurt in week one. Uh, ben Barst, their left guard, coming into the year, got hurt, probably out for the season. So not making excuses or anything like that, um, but but they just they, they really cannot protect Lawrence right now, and it's caused problems. And then I will say, though, the Chiefs defense is really, really good. I mean, we saw them without Chris Jones hold the Detroit Lions to 14 points on offense. And then and then, and then Chris Jones was a single-handedly a, a game wrecker in, in this performance. Um, I mean, it was just was out of this world. So I think it's more the Chiefs defense and the Jags offensive line. You know, Robinson comes back in week five. I, I think they'll figure it out. All right. Titans get their first win of the season in overtime and take the Chargers to 0-2. and two. That's one of the major surprises if I think you look around the NFL. But what, what about the Titans putting up 27, getting it done in overtime? Impressions, shortcomings you might see through the first two weeks of that Tennessee team? Yeah, yeah you know, I think it really is just an epic failure by the Chargers defense. Uh, which is crazy considering, you know, Rand Staley is the head coach and is a defensive play caller. They poured resources into that unit. And, and for the Titans, their offensive line might be the worst on paper in the NFL. And, and Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack were relatively ineffective in that game. You know, the interior for the Chargers doesn't really have a pass rusher. You know, Morgan Fox is a good rotational player. He did have a sack in that game. But, but Tannehill, after week one against the Saints, being able to do nothing, three interceptions, a bunch of sacks, did, did absolutely nothing. Was, was phenomenal. They had one of the better games he's had in years, um, which is just a massive, massive indictment on the Chargers. But, yeah, look, the Titans and Mike Vrabel, 
They're going to be coached well. They're going to execute well. They're the best run defense in the NFL and have been for a couple of years now. Um, and, and they just find a way to win football games. Uh, Brad Spielberger of PFF giving us updates through two weeks of the season, as he always does every Tuesday right here on 93.5 and 107.5, the fan on the Indy, on the uh, Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. I, I'm curious, as far as the Bills were concerned, I, I wanted to cover that offense up with a lot of dirt after week number one and what took place in Jersey and that loss in overtime to the Jets. And I wanted to question the amount of weapons they have and then – I'm curious. You had Cook go for a buck twenty-three. Gabe Davis nearly a hundred yards and a touchdown. So you had that offense get back in gear. Was that more about that offense being certainly more legit and me judging way too early, or more about the Raiders' defense that didn't show in Buffalo? I actually share all of your concerns. I really do think against good defenses, they, they don't have enough pass-catching weapons. Um, you know, Gabe Davis is an okay number two receiver, but disappears against good corners all the time. You know, rookie Dalton Kincaid, the tight end, has already made a bunch of plays. Dawson Knox, the team's you know, revitalized now that the team spent a first-round pick on another tight end. Uh, they've done things differently now with personnel, being able to put out two tight ends in the football field. And James Cook is certainly coming into his own after a quiet rookie season. But but I think it also talks about how good that Jets defense is. I know. You know, the Cowboys were able to move the football. Uh, you know, C.D. Lamb had a huge day. They score a bunch of points. Obviously, their defense was also just dominating Zach Wilson and the Jets' offense. But, no, the Bills will get back on track. But I, I agree with you. I have concerns about their offensive line and the depth in their weaponry. Is it enough when you're going up against the elite teams in the AFC? You know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, Lions uh, read too many of the headlines? or Because when you watch Seattle lose at home and they're open to the Rams – I, that was a red flag. And then you go into Detroit. I mean, you really do own most of that game. A uh, little come from behind action. Um, you know, Lions, obviously, early on looked good. Stepped up late, losing in overtime. Was that about the Lions maybe reading a lot of those those headlines about themselves? Or was that more about the Seahawks just being road impressive Sunday? Uh, I think Seattle came to play. And, you know, I think they bounced back from, like you said, it was, for me, the most surprising week one outcome across the entire NFL I think in that game, though, that they had one half in the second half or maybe the third quarter where they did nothing, like truly could not move the football at all. Um, and, and I think you're just that's not going to happen every week. They have an explosive offense. When you have DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, and rookie Jackson Smith and Jigba, you know, all playing well, they're going to score a whole lot of points. And, and they do deserve credit. They were missing both starting tackles in that game and still hung 37 points on the Detroit Lions defense, which not a great unit, but but not a terrible unit. So. I think it was more about Seattle. I think Detroit also will be fine. I like them to bounce back and beat Atlanta at home this week. Uh, but Seattle just, just laid an egg week one and, and looked more like themselves in week two. Hey, Brad, I'm curious, too, before I let you go. Commanders beat the Broncos on Sunday, 35-33. And we all know last year and so much of that blame in Denver was placed on you know Nathaniel Hackett, who's no longer there, and their quarterback, Russell Wilson, um, and, and, and obviously now you, you get a situation where Russell Wilson gets a reboot with a coach that has a great history of high level of winning in Sean Payton. He told his quarterback to stop being such a politician and, and worry about football. How has that been? Even with the 0-2 start, how has that been for Russell Wilson through the first two weeks in Denver? Yeah, this is classic football. The offense has looked much better. You know, in a lot of different metrics, they've been around a top 10 offense. They did have a Hail Mary, you know, that kind of boosts some of those numbers. But they stayed ahead of schedule. They've been successful at getting first downs and maintaining series. And obviously they couldn't do a darn thing last year on offense. But, of course, you let Ajiro Averro, the defensive coordinator, go. He's now in Carolina, where I think he's been exceptional. Um, and, and you bring in Vance Joseph, and, and the Broncos' defense has been horrific. So, you know, it's funny. Last year, the defense was elite, truly elite defense last year, and the offense couldn't do a thing. Now the offense is actually playing pretty well, uh, and the defense can't stop a nosebleed. So that, that's just football for you. All right, what do you think Cleveland ends up doing as far as a running back is concerned with the loss of Nick Chubb and what was a horrific injury last night? Yeah, so sad to see. You know, I think one of the better pure runners in the NFL. Looks like Kareem Hunt, by the way, according to ESPN, is paying a visit to the Browns today. Does he reemerge there? 
there you go. So I've mean, obviously been there before. I still think even if they do re-sign Cream Hunt, I think this is Jerome Ford's backfield. We saw him last night, broke off the 70-yard run where he went down at the one-yard line, but he's a three-down back to me. He can catch the ball, he can pass protect, and he obviously is clearly, you know, had a bunch of really nice runs last night against the Pittsburgh Steelers. So, yeah, they'll probably add some help, but I think this is Jerome Ford's job to lose for right now. So the, the injuries around the NFL at the running back position, and the situation with Jonathan Taylor, does that add to it in a positive or take even more away from Taylor's situation right now? How do you view that? Yeah, I mean, if you're him, you're sitting there, Saquon Barkley out for three weeks, you know, doesn't help his, his contract prospects. He has all these incentives tied to production that become infinitely harder to earn now because he misses maybe, you know, around three weeks of the report. Um, I mean, look, Taylor has to play. He, he cannot allow his contract to toll and, and be a, you know, a fourth-year player again next year. He has to get in the football game and, and, and not you know, continue this battle back and forth. But I'm sure at the same time he's also saying, yeah, this is why I wanted to get paid. You know, you're seeing why I'm all about this. Nick Chubb, for example, um, you know, got paid after his third season, was elite for two more years. And now, I mean, I hope this isn't true, but, I mean, we might never see that Nick Chubb ever again. That's how bad that injury was. That's why these guys got to get paid, you know, after three years. That's uh, yeah. Well, and you can certainly understand why he was he was pushing for it. I mean, obviously, people are going to look at both sides, and I, I think around here, more people side, you know, with the Colts organizationally speaking. But you can certainly see why that he wanted wanted to get paid when you watch what takes place here around the NFL right now. What are you writing about? Yep, so I got an article coming out tomorrow about the biggest impact free agent additions across the NFL. Only been two weeks, but I think there's been some really impactful uh, additions across the NFL so far. Uh, Give me one. Give, Give me one. Not necessarily at the top of your list, but give me one. Yeah, sure. I I think the Atlanta Falcons have a couple on there, and I'll give you one of them. Um, Is linebacker Caden Ellis, kind of a name that flew under the radar, barely played for the Saints until his fourth year last year. Um, He's kind of a jack-of-all-trades. He he can rush the passer. He can cover. He can play against the run. He's been great so far. All right, so we'll check it out. Brad Spielberger again with us from Pro Football Focus. Every Tuesday right here with a look around the NFL, and especially through two weeks of the season, as always, via the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. Brad, I appreciate you. We'll do it again next Tuesday. Sounds great. Thank you. Brad Spielberger, Pro Football Focus on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. Matt Taylor, bottom of the hour, Kravitz. Going to be here coming up in the 5 o'clock hour with a column, his latest regarding uh, the situation in concussion protocol and the future of Anthony Richardson. We'll talk to Bob about that coming up at the top of the hour. Adam Sandler tickets we have to give away as well. And on the road Thursday and Friday, locations I will inform you because I hopefully get a chance to see you and give you an opportunity to win something for coming out as well. That and more Coming up, Matt Taylor, voice of the Colts on the other side. Inside the lounge via YouTube Live, where I'm always participating, by the way, as I am right now in there. 93.5 and 107.5, the fan. Hey, it's Dan Dockage here for a...
Yeah, welcome back. Bob Kravitz, top of the hour. Adam Sandler tickets coming at you. At some point, it's a November show at Gambridge Fieldhouse. Our next guest, one of the greatest things he's ever done outside of becoming the voice of the Colts, is when I was uh, blackballed and a hindrance to the show, if you remember, uh, down at the JW during the Super Bowl when it was here, uh, I made some unfortunate comments regarding Adam Schefter, and he cried like a little baby to ESPN and then got my ass in a sling, and then nobody from ESPN would go on with me during Super Bowl week, with it, which is really detrimental. And to save today, the voice of the Colts, Matt Taylor, who at the time was my producer because he booked what incredible actor comedian. Matt, do you remember? I think it's got to be Adam Sandler. You booked right? Adam Sandler. Saved the week right there. I did. Yeah, you know, thinking about that, I still have pictures of that interview. I still have pictures of you sitting with him. That seems like so long ago. You got to send that to me. Marriott. I don't have pictures of that. Yeah, yeah. And Radio radio Row in the JW Marriott looking over. Uh, what would that be? That would be left field of Victory Field. Uh, the Super Bowl that was a that was a great week, man. I mean, we were you and I were both so busy that entire yep. week that looking back on it, it's a blur. But uh, man, what a what a fun time! I don't even know how the heck we even got to downtown the Circle that week to park because it was just I mean road closure after road closure and party after party going on and. That was that was a good ass time. Man. I it so really much want to do that again. I I, I so mm-hmm. wish in my lifetime they would be able to obtain another Super Bowl. I I have some serious doubts on that ever happening again. But certainly, it, it would be deserved because it was outstanding. But yeah, you're right. I yeah. mean, you and I you you booked Adam Sandler. I got to stand next to Madonna. Remember when she walked in, <laughs> walked into the room at the JW Marriott. But Sandler was yeah. awesome. Sandler was awesome right up until he invited me to play pickup basketball the next yeah. morning at uh, at the field house and then <laughs> nobody called me to go play i was sitting on the edge of my bed ready to go too i remember that because that was a friday we had sandler on on a friday yep. and then the next day was supposedly the day they were going to play pickup hoop at, at the then conseco field house i was like hurt I, I got hurt wednesday night playing basketball over at uh <laughs> whatever greenwood christian is now <laughs> so yeah. i got hurt there i remember you you called me up. You're like, man, I haven't gotten a call yet. You know, it's noon. I don't know what time <laughs> no, to play in. I don't think I'm going to get a call. I'm like, yeah, I don't know, man. You might be shut out this time around. I took Playing so many too. drugs. I took so many painkillers. <laughs> and I was ready to go. I was ready to go. And then I found out that evidently I wasn't invited because I see pictures from the Pacers that had Sandler playing pickup with a bunch of dudes, including Casey Kane, the NASCAR driver. I thought, you invited that clown oh, and not nice. me. Yeah. yeah, wasn't he, like, doing a movie with them? Wasn't he, like, making a cameo? He was really Probably. big back then. I mean, this is, you know, 10, yeah. 11 years ago. Yeah, I, he was – I remember seeing him on Radio Row. I mean, I mean, I, I hate to take too much credit for that because – No, no, you did. I mean, All the credit in the world. I was – I well, screwed us. I completely – with my Schefter stuff, I screwed <laughs> us. And you remember, who did you ask? And they told you that they weren't allowed to go on with me. Well, it was whoever was handling uh, Mike and Mike. Okay. Because uh, they they were probably, you know, pubbing some book or pubbing. I mean, everybody's pubbing something on, on Radio Row that week. And there's handlers and PR guys everywhere, you know. So you just have to do the song and dance and get in line. And, you know, they asked me, you know, who I, who I was, where I was from, you know, what show I was on. And then I just remember the guys, like, the guys' eyebrows went way up. They're like, uh-oh, <laughs> I don't think I'm supposed to talk to you. <laughs> so, yeah, anybody from ESPN, which – you know, back then ESPN, it, it, it was a behemoth. It, you yeah. know, it's, it's sort of a shell of itself now. But back then, man, I mean, the whole place was just ESPN. I mean, it was just crawling with analysts and writers and talk show hosts. And again, they're all either either on the air all day, or they're pubbing something, or they're doing a million different interviews. And yeah, you and I were just sort of in, in the corner, thanks to the, to the Schefter <laughs> feud. Uh, yeah, but, but we made it work. I think we had enough. Yeah. You know, high a, a plus, you know, big name guest that week. But yeah, Sandler was he was the grand slam man. Now nah, you, yeah, I mean that's that made the entire week. It didn't matter who else you had on. I mean, you you <laughs> nailed him down and brought him on the show. I, I just remember we had some promotions people that were uh, in Pan Am Plaza with the ESPN folks, and I guess they were in line for lunch over there. 
And I forget, they were behind Van Pelt or somebody, and they were talking about how they went on Radio yeah. Row and they went in this market or that market, but, you know, we're not allowed to go on in Indy in the afternoon because of what JMV said about Adam. <laughs> right, right right in front of him, I go, ah, way to go, yeah. jerk. So, yeah, I, I yeah, could have you, royally screwed us that week, but you saved the day. Yeah, you made life you made life easy on the producer, I can tell you that, man. All right. <laughs> well, you, you, making life easier on you know, Colts fans to enjoy, you know, get them some juice, get them fired up. That yeah. win in Houston, I think, did just that. And, and obviously, you don't want to see Anthony Richardson in this situation ever. But it was interesting to see exactly what Gardner Minshew did when given the opportunity. And, and Matt, in fact, what he did was exactly what people thought he was going to do, and I'm assuming exactly what the, the Colts, in this case, and Shane Steichen felt he could do because they brought him in as the backup. I mean, he comes in. It's remarkable. I mean, I asked Shane Steichen uh, that exact same question on, on our roundtable show last night. I mean, like, this guy comes in. He has no first-team practice reps all week long. He hasn't been taking, you know, starting quarterback reps really since the middle of training camp. Like, like you know, that's the middle of August up at Grand Park. Uh, and then he comes in off the bench, right, out of the bullpen, no time to warm up. And he just goes out there and he leads three straight scoring drives. Uh, he's on fire in the second quarter for the game, completes like 83% of his passes. And the Colts, they were really never in danger of losing that game, you know, because, you know, Gardner Minshew comes in off the bench and just holds, holds down the, the Ford offensively and just does what Gardner Minshew does. And that's just take what the defense gives them, incredibly accurate, getting a lot of guys involved. And there's just no panic. There's, there's no reason for, you know, all the other guys, the, 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 uh, the 10 other guys in the huddle to not believe in Gardner Minshew because of the guy that he's been here this entire time since he signed back in March, but also just the player he's been throughout his entire career. He's just incredibly cool and steady, incredibly sure of himself, and he knows this playbook like the back of his hand. So, you know, when, when Shane Steichen has to see his starting quarterback go out and then has to put in Gardner Minshew, I mean, it's just like, all right, well, let's just do what we did in Philadelphia. I mean, this guy knows the playbook, you know, maybe as good as I do. And we just go out there and we draw up what we were incredibly successful with uh, the last couple of years in Philadelphia. Jim Bob Cooter knew him really well. You know, he was a consultant at one time uh, in Philadelphia with with, uh, with Gardner Minshew. So uh, I was not at all shocked um, by that performance. In fact, I went over to the – the home radio booth with uh, Mark Vandermeer after the game, kind of just talked about the game and shook hands and stuff like that. And he's like, Gardner Minshew, like he's like the most underrated player in the NFL. And I said, you bet your bottom dollar he is, man, because that's exactly why the Colts signed him, because if Richardson goes out, they need a guy they can believe in, compete with, and win football games. And all of those things came to uh, fruition uh, starting in the second quarter two days ago. The other thing that they had done was run the football. And, and I gave the utmost credit to Zach Moss because, to me, I, I thought if there were differences in that game and certainly in level of play there were, and listen, Houston's not any good, but still you go down there and get a road win. But if there was a top-of-the-hill type of difference, to me, it was the running game and the 88 yards and the nearly five yards per clip. And really, the the thing I noticed more so out of Moss, Matt, than anything else was the yards that he got after contact. I mean, it, it just seemed like mm -hmm. if we were going to go back and watch the film, which you know I won't, but if we were going to do that, the yards after contact, it was heavy duty for him on Sunday afternoon in Houston. Yeah, I think the number was he averaged three yards uh, after contact, which is really, really good. I mean, that's that's a huge difference. I mean, that's that's the difference between second and eight and second and five. I mean, that, that just, and, and Jim Bob Cooter today talked about that. I mean, when you have, you know, that sort of uh, grinding out mentality and you are staying ahead of the chains down and distance wise, I mean, that, that changes everything for your offense and it opens up the entire playbook for the play caller in this case, Shane Steichen. Um, yeah. So you're exactly right. Now the thing going forward that you're going to have to monitor is, all right, at the beginning of the season without Jonathan Taylor, it was going to be running back by committee. Uh, you know, we know we know how that approach worked in game number one. Obviously, Moss wasn't a part of that. In game number two, it was all Moss. Moss was the committee, right? There was no committee other than Zach Moss. He was the only running back to, to tote the rock for the Colts. Um, you know, I looked it up. He played 
56, I think the number was 56 of 57 snaps offensively for the game, which is 98%. And I think his, his highest number participation wise uh, in the offense for a game in his career was like in the seventies. So he just blew it out of the water and, you know, he's coming off of that forearm injury and, you know, I mean, he's still really, really uh, in in great shape condition wise, but I mean, anytime you miss that amount of time, you know, you're going to get out of football shape just because you're not playing football. So I was really impressed with his conditioning, his durability, and just his fight to get yards after contact and to keep that, that running game. I mean, 88 yards, it's a really good game, but it's not like, you know, they're not going to be leading off Sunday night football, the pregame show with that performance, but considering, you know, where the offense was a week ago in the running game and just what they need yeah. in order to complement uh, whomever the quarterback is, that was really, really good to see. And you're supposed to do that against, a, you know, an inferior opponent, uh, an inferior defense. But, you know, Zach Moss gives them, you know, a one-cut downhill, grinded-out kind of banger-style running back in the running game that the Colts desperately need now going forward. Saw where they picked up Sermon today and added him to the practice squad. I, I kind of wonder what may be the future there. People had asked me back during that Philly preseason game because he was the primary runner. They're trying to make a decision on who they're going to keep in that backfield, and ultimately he was the odd man out in Philadelphia. But a lot of people had asked me if the Colts should go out and get him, and then you fast forward not nearly a month but close to it, and he's back yeah. in the fold at least on the practice squad right now here. Yeah, you're always trying to you know tinker with – you know, the back end of your roster and your practice squad, you know, so we'll see where, where he's in the mix with, with players like, you know, Jake Funk and uh, Deion Jackson and things like that. But, you know, I've always liked him. I mean, the the thing that stands out to me about Trey Sermon, like, you know, word association, I just remember that, that COVID year in the Big Ten championship game. Remember at Ohio State when he was like maybe second or third on the depth chart? They yeah. get really banged up at running back, and then he goes off for like, 250 rushing yards against Northwestern in the Big Ten championship game. Um, you know, so we saw him in the preseason. He was with Philly. You know, he got a steady dose of carries in that game against the Colts, you know, back in late August. Um, I think he's got 11 total carries in the NFL. But, you know, I think he's a, a guy that can definitely be in the mix, you know, to be called up if, if the Colts want to go that route as they try to just get incrementally better at running back. But it's definitely going to be a puzzle and something that they're kind of, you know, moving pieces around up until up until week five, and we all know what that means with Jonathan Taylor and the decision the Colts have to make there uh, after he comes off of PUP. As a Reds fan, do you think we're watching the uh, the final couple of weeks of Votto? Uh, you know what? I saw some clip yesterday on social media. You know, somebody asked him if he's starting to get reflective on if this upcoming homestand, or the, the current homestand, I should say, that they're on right now is – is possibly going to be his last. And he gave a really good, thoughtful, uh, you know, introspective comment. Um, But I don't know, man. Like, I don't think there's any reason to think, like, he can't come back. I mean, is he under contract for one more year? I think he's got one more year after this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, So there's no reason to think why he can't come back. It's just a matter of if the Reds would want to do that as they continue to invest in – um, you know, see what they got in this this core of, of young players that they have. I know he's been banged up here as of late, but uh, I, I just hope for his sake they can make this this last couple of weeks here, these, these next couple of two weeks, make one final push, get him in the playoffs, and, and give him a signature signature moment, you know, in the month of October, which is the only thing missing on his career, which is all the naysayers have to point to, you know, with this Hall of Fame candidacy is that he's been on a bunch of bad teams, and he's never won a playoff series, and he's never really done anything in the postseason because he's played his entire career in Cincinnati. Yeah, I um, this has been enjoyable for me. And I know you as a Reds fan, you're probably paying attention to more Colt stuff right now than the Reds, and I understand that. It's, it, it, it has been – June would have been enough for me considering the recent history of being a Reds oh, yeah. fan. But them being where they are right now in contention – with this little time left in the season, um, I, I'm going to look back at this, I think, regardless, fondly, because it got me re-engaged with this team again. Well, you just talked about it. June, I mean, June was historically yeah. fun as a Red right. fan because they were on that winning streak. They were hitting bombs. They were beating great teams. They were having all these come-from-behind wins. And then July hit, right? The All-Star game hit, and then 
it went downhill. July was just like, no oh, man, here we go again. But they've definitely, you know, steadied the ship. They've, they've treaded water. I think they've played some 500 baseball here in the back half of July and August, which is why they're in the position that they're in right now. And it's, it's certainly a jumbled mess with the Cubs and the, you know, the Diamondbacks and the Giants and the Marlins all in the mix for, you know, those three wild card spots. But I completely agree with you. I mean, every time somebody asks me about this season, they know how hardcore of a Reds fan I am. I'm just like, this is so enjoyable. Yep. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy it. And, and I don't get upset when they lose. I don't get upset when they go on three or four game losing skids like they did earlier this summer, because you've had just such disappointing seasons up until then. You didn't know what the plan was. You know, you had trades and you had, you know, guys leaving you they were shedding uh, costs and contracts and all of that stuff. And, Going into the season, you had no idea what to expect. You certainly didn't expect this. So they're ahead of schedule. So you're along for the ride. You're just hoping for the best. And, you know, I, I just remember whatever year it was, John, like 2011, 2012. Remember when the Nationals had Steven Strasburg and they shut him down? He was coming off an injury. They were going to make the playoffs, but they shut Strasburg yeah, down exactly. right before the playoffs because they said, well, he's reached his, his inning limit. Yeah. We don't want we, we to test that arm. It's like – no, you're going to make the playoffs in baseball. Like, that's really hard to do. You play 162 games. No matter how good your roster is the upcoming season, nothing's guaranteed. Like, there's not a given that you're going to make the playoffs next season that includes Strasburg. So yep. go for it now. That's kind of where I'm at right now with the Reds. Like, let's go for it. Let's put all of our chips in. Nothing's guaranteed next year despite this great nucleus. And I just want to see how far it goes. I'm, I'm excited for it. So uh, Matt Taylor, voice of the Colts, of course, coming up on Sunday, 1 o'clock is that kick in Baltimore. Countdown to kickoffs at noon. And we'll be live in Carmel from a road touchdown town for the Colts pregame huddle beginning at 10 a.m. up in Carmel on Sunday morning. The voice of the Colts, Matt Taylor, via the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. Matt, I appreciate you, buddy. We'll talk, I'm sure, off the air later on this week. Have a good one. You got it, man. Anytime. Be good. It's uh, Matt Taylor on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. Kravitz, top of the hour. Sandler tickets to give away to 93.5107. Five the
97.5, The Fan. Bob Kravitz is going to join us coming up a little bit after 5 here. His latest column talks about how he's getting scary, and this was like in the now here. Andrew Luck vibes from Anthony Richardson. We'll talk to Bob about that. And the one-and-one Colts start. Some other stuff with Bob. Musings of an old sports writer. Bob Kravitz going to join us and your chance to win Adam Sandler tickets. Do not leave. That show, Gamebridge Fieldhouse, coming up in November. Your chance to win coming up in the 5 o'clock hour. 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. One zero seven five, the fan. Yeah, you got Greta Van Fleet coming into town on Friday, Cambridge Fieldhouse. You can catch us if you're going to the show. 
Kilroy's downtown on a Bud Light Blue Friday on Friday. We've got Rams Colts tickets to give away. Should be a good time. Greta Van Fleet. A lot of fans out there going to see that show at Gambridge Fieldhouse. In fact, whenever Bob gets done on the golf course, Bob Kravitz will join us. And Bob and Chris Hagen and I are going to Brown County Music Center. And I want to see Squeeze. I've never seen Squeeze before. Um, Tempted, right? If you don't know anything about the 80s group Squeeze, Tempted uh, is their signature song. Uh, With many others, too. Pulling Muscles from the Shell, Hourglass. Um, and then Psychedelic First, a group I've seen before, absolutely awesome. So back-to-back Brown County Music Center, which is an awesome place to see a show. Uh, with me and Hagen and Kravitz, and hopefully we'll see you guys down there coming up on uh, Friday. Big weekend, certainly. Of course, the Colts on the road in Baltimore. you got week six of the high school football season. How about Notre Dame and Ohio State coming up on Saturday night, too? That's something for you. Uh, are you going to the black uniforms against Akron coming up on Saturday evening, too? It's a big weekend, to say the least. Uh, more Colts conversation. Bob's going to join me, as I mentioned, coming up in a minute. But between uh, now and then, time for you at 239-1070. And Grant's on hold and is going to join us right now. Hello, Grant. How are you? Hey, how's it going, JMV? Fantastic. I'm doing pretty good. Go ahead, Grant. Listen, uh, I think... We all kind of have some Andrew Luck trauma regarding uh, Richardson's injury. I mean, it's understandable. I mean, our Colts are notorious for having the injury bug. Yes. But I think these few hits he's taken the first couple games are just your general welcome to the NFL hits. I mean, he's barely even played in college. So, I mean, he's usually the biggest guy on the field when he's sure. out there. And this is going to be a big change for him. Sure, but I think that the reaction of most around here is appropriate given the circumstances of the past. I, I completely agreed. understand it, yeah. You agree? Agreed, agreed. Yeah. No, no, and you know what? Some people have even called it maybe kind of a fluke thing on, on Sunday. And maybe that's the case. You just want to try to, to sidestep that, no pun intended here, as uh, as much as, as possible. But, yeah, there's, I think there's a given reason why people are reacting the way that that they are right now. Hopefully hopefully we, we don't remember this, and that's not going to be an issue. But, uh, unfortunately, we have a, a lot of proof in the past and experience on this level. So we'll see. Grant, anything else? Uh, that's it. That's it. Thanks, Stanley. You call any time, Grant. Thank you. Sandler tickets before 6 o'clock. Don't go away for that. Chris writes this. I'm uh, the only one in this case, right, JMV, that thought the hit Richardson took was completely unnecessary. The league is all about safety, and the only thing the hit was going to do was to knock him out, which it did. You know, it's funny. You, you view it, Chris, on both sides. You view it unnecessary from Stewart's standpoint and a Houston standpoint, but you also view it. I know a lot of people ask, you know, you, you decelerate into the end zone and you kind of welcome in that side hit. And then when asked on Sunday after the game, the teammates of Richardson all suggested that Richardson – didn't see Stewart. So this stuff is going to happen. It is going to happen. I mean, look what happened last night. You had two two major face mask penalties on Deshaun Watson. I mean, he's meaning to do that stuff. Meaning to do it. But evidently there was, you know, no further action, at least not what I have seen taken in that game for Cleveland and Pittsburgh last night. But I, I get what you're saying. I'm just making sure that people understand that this is going to occur again, and you just hope that it's nothing severe, nothing major. Um, And I know that you have experience with this in the past, but this is even more different. Like in the past, it was because, you know, the quarterback was trying to, you know, extend the play or whatever it was called then, and it was in scramble mode. These are going to be designed runs and there's going to be a lot more of them coming and probably other situations like this that you're going to have to get used to and then Richardson's going to have to grow from and hopefully not take a hit like he did on Sunday fair or unfair Chris from that Houston secondary 
something everybody's going to have to get used to because that is the design of this offense, and certainly until much further notice. Roland is at 239-1070. Roland, welcome to the show. Hey, man, what's going on? Y'all still owe me brisket from uh, Pat uh, Sullivan's Hardware uh, when Joe Stasniak at the time ate up all the food before I got there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we all are owed a little brisket. Yes. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I remember exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, but, you know, my thing is I didn't like the Ursay's uh, uh, outlook on this thing. Yeah. He's a big, strong kid. I think we need to – that gives me more reason to have Jonathan Taylor in the mix because you cannot utilize this big, strong guy as he's been described as like a battering ram. We need to – he's got so much potential to be a good passer, to be a good runner, and we need to diversify this offense enough to maximize – No, no, you're right. That's that's exactly what they're going yeah. to do. I mean, that's, that's it. I mean, there's no stopping right. it here. I mean, whether or not I mean, he gets hit in the end zone or, as as Chris has mentioned, you know, unfairly, which, I mean, it's in the field of play and it's happening, so it's going to happen more. That's not going to be the first time. I'm sure for him it's not going to be the last time for him. But, yes, to get more around him is what we're talking about for the future, and that's that's what you build on. That's what we've talked about for a number of years, but especially now with this quarterback. And then, it, you know, the end zone play was like one of those iffy, iffy things. At that point in time, he's there at the end zone. There was a chance he could have fumbled. There's no doubt. And he could have gone out of whatever would have happened. Could have gone yeah. out of bounds. And that's why I said you just got to gotta get ready for it. And exactly. you got to get ready for it as the fan, Roland. And he's got to get ready for it as the playmaker, a quarterback, that's going to be running outside the pocket on design runs. You just might yeah, as well prep because there's going to be more to come. Yeah, more to come. Yeah. And, okay, and I hope to see you soon and uh, check out the Blue Friday. Hopefully I can make it. You got it. Friday, Kilroy's downtown, Bud Light Blue Friday, Rams Colts tickets to give away. If you're on hold, I'll get back to you in a second. Fresh off a round of 18, I'm assuming on his home course, that is Prairie View, Bob Kravitz joins us. Now, Bob Kravitz, of course, has the uh, the column, and it's uh, – Incredibly good, as always, musings of an old sports writer that you can find, substack.com slash at Bob Kravitz. Bob joins us now. Um, are you, you got vibes with Andrew Luck of the past, with Anthony Richardson in the present? Yeah, it scares me to death, you know. I mean, certainly if I was, you know, if I was a fan, I, I you know, I'd be worried about it. I mean, you know, look, th- this is something that we're going to have to deal with um, for as long as Anthony Richardson plays here, you know, he's a running quarterback. Uh, he's going to be in harm's way. Uh, so you have to be concerned about his health and welfare. And, you know, I think he learned a valuable lesson the other day that when you're, you're going anywhere, you got to go hundred percent. You can't slow down heading into the end zone. I guess he never saw that Stewart guy. Uh, coming, but uh, you got to go. You got to go assume. I, I, I would guess you would have to assume in this case, right? I mean, he right, just do. Right. Yeah. But you got you got to run through the tape. You know, if we're talking. Yeah. Bobby, you still there? Did you disappear? Oh, there you go. I'm sorry, you disappeared for a moment. Go ahead and and tell me. You, we missed a couple of words of what you said. You said running through the okay. tape. Yeah, through the tape. I mean, uh, because he slowed down. You know. Uh, downshifted just a little bit i thought that gave uh stewart a couple of seconds to catch up and and lay a pretty good lick on him so you know i think he learned a valuable lesson and hopefully he's back in the next week or two now uh, any good signs that you've heard that you have seen so far I that would help, yeah, help you you know maybe guess whether or not he's going to play i said when asked on sunday and this was how they handled um this this is you know the, how they'd handled it so far that I I would be hard pressed to say that he was going to play, but I mean these are all just throwing darts at the dartboard at this time because you don't really know anything until you get to the latter portions of the week and see what happens practice wise and see where he right. is within that concussion protocol. Well, well, the thing is, you know, the star had something interesting the other day um, that some, I, I forget the exact numbers, but roughly twenty twenty two percent of guys who suffer concussions come back that week. Uh, the vast majority are, are two weeks. So, you know, based on that, I would totally guess that he probably won't be uh, available for Baltimore. 
but again, you know, I, 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 concussions are, are they're all unique, and everybody recovers differently. It's it's a brain injury for God's sake. So, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, if you're looking for information from uh, Shane Steichen, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it comes in like a four word answer, then yes, it'll yeah. be there. So yeah, that's, exactly. that's just how it is. I, you know what? I don't think he's ever going to be any different than he is right now. Do you? Do you think nope. he evolves into being more of? I don't want to call no. it an open book, but more of a a longer worded answer because I think in 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 terms of Shane Steichen, and, and I hate to say this, but it kind of is what it is, right? He's uh, he's he's like a nice Belichick, you know. He doesn't say very much. He's very uh, cl- plays everything right. close to the vest. You don't get the sense that he thinks we're a bunch of idiots or that he hates us the way uh, Belichick does. But that's just kind of the way he rolls. And and you know, I'm perfectly fine with it. I mean, you don't have to take care of the media to be a good coach. You know, I mean, it's nice for the media to have a Frank Reich or a Chuck Pagano who give you really thoughtful answers and, you know, you know, uh, humor and everything else. But um, look, you know, you just, if he wins, it doesn't matter. If he wins, it doesn't matter. And I thought he coached a hell of a game the other day. Um, You know, I thought that, that fourth down maneuver when he did like a a hockey line change and forced Houston to use uh, one of its timeouts, I thought that was a brilliant maneuver. Um, and, you know, the fact that uh, he was able to, uh, you know, get Minshew in there and they didn't miss a beat offensively uh, until late when they uh, they kind of throttled down. But, no, I, I you know, it's, 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 it's fine. So Bob Kravitz on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline I saw this morning where Jeff Saturday was back with yeah. ESPN. I am curious if we should ever expect to hear the real story because I, I can't imagine this would this would make something that would be of interest for a while on how everything went down and what really went down from start to finish of his interim reign as coach a year ago. Do you think we'll ever get even bits and pieces of the actual story? Well, I, I think I think Jeff will probably talk about it at some point. Um, you know, I don't think he's going to talk to the local media about it necessarily because I think he was pretty uh, pretty upset by the way we we handled his uh, interim uh, period uh, that he coached. Uh, but I would think you know somebody from ESPN will probably write it at some point. Uh, I have not reached out to Jeff uh, in a long time. He, you know. I mean, I'm happy for him. He's good on TV, and I think that's probably what he needs to do. See, I, I know uh, from what I was told, I shouldn't say I know, but from what I was told, uh, obviously the the petition that was put forth a year ago about uh, hopefully not bringing him back as a head coach, and that petition obviously went online. Um, I, I, from what I was told, you know, that obviously didn't make him happy as somebody that had put in so much in the past as a player right. uh, here with this, this Colts team. Did, did he feel the same way about those that wrote about this team and covered this team last year? Well, apparently he, he reached out to a couple of the writers to, uh, to, you know, uh, not complain, but just, just converse about what's being written. He never did with me, and I don't know if that's because he knows it's a hopeless cause, or if he just didn't, you know, didn't have any problem with what I was writing. So, but he did reach out to some writers, and uh, you know, uh, have conversations with them, and that's cool. You know, I, I, I always tell uh, athletes and, and coaches, if you got a problem with something I wrote, and just, just freaking call me. You, you got my number, and I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, take a, another look at what I wrote and see if it was fair or not. So Bob Kravitz with us, we got two weeks to look back here and reflect Anthony Richardson, Bryce young, um, and, and certainly CJ Stroud, which we saw on Sunday as well. Give me some of your impressions on the rookie quarterbacks. that are always going to be put up against one another and evaluated against one another. Give me your thoughts through the first two weeks of the season. Well, I think, I think Anthony's looks terrific. I mean, you know, the, his, he's uh, averaging about, what, 64% completion 
Um, the the big concern with him coming in was was uh, you know uh, wh- whether he could hit an open receiver, especially in the short and intermediate game. And he's looked really good. Um, I think of the three rookies, he's probably looked the best. I mean, Stroud Stroud put up big numbers the other day, but I I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you know, it's 384 yards, and I, I got to guess that about 200 of them were in the last quarter, quarter and a half, when the Colts had a pretty sizable lead and were just playing prevent defense. Um, I watched uh, Bryce Young. One thing that Mike Lombardi, my friend, brought up, he said, you know, you can't protect this kid, but you got five guys out in the, in the, in the uh, you know, going out for passes. That doesn't make any sense. So I, I didn't think he had a whole heck of a lot of help, but he's looked – he has not looked great uh, so far, but I, I think all three of those guys are going to be real solid. Uh, but yeah, so far I think Anthony's been the best of the lot. See, I, I thought Stroud looked good, and I thought Stroud looked good more so than anything else, as he had absolutely zero outside of Collins to work with. Right. I mean, right. nothing. And no running game. No running game. And nothing. And, and I, I thought the coaching sucked. I mean, I, I thought that the situation he was placed in, they were down 21, and it was like a glacier flowing offensively. It was unbelievable. Yeah. I, I'm sitting there talking to my wife, you know, and I'm like, do these guys think they're ahead by yeah. 14? I was shocked at the lack of urgency by by Houston in that game. They were down, what, 31 to 10, and they're just taking their sweet – well, they were down two scores. They were down 11, and – there's six minutes left, and they're just taking their sweet time. I, I, I don't know what they were doing. I, I really don't. I, I just thought he had zero around him, and for him to get through it and 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 put up those numbers, and and at least I mean there was some interest late. He had it, and I I, I did. I, I was impressed with that. I've obviously been impressed with Richardson. And I saw the second half of Young, and you know, I just go, why? Yeah. What's he, some people tell me that maybe you get some of the similar situations of play calling and, and lack of creativity offensively with Frank Reich in Carolina. Then you also hear the fact that there's just not a lot around him. And you're there's talking about Thielen and, you know, Shark and, and guys like that to throw to. It's not a robust offensive productivity-wise for your rookie quarterback. No, and they and they don't protect him. You know? No, I mean and he, he's a little guy. Um, you know, you you've got to give him give him uh, protection if he's going to do anything. I I still think he's going to be really good. I, I despite the the lack of size, I think he's going to be fine as long as he can stay healthy. The funny thing is that you know everybody is talking about uh, Anthony, uh, you know, uh, and and the injuries. You know, everybody thought that. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Yeah. Bryce Young was going to be the guy who was going to get beat up. And yet it's the six, four, 244 pound guy who's dealing with these injuries. And he's just got to learn to protect himself. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Because they're going to keep on coming because this offense isn't going to change. And you know, this offense prioritizes him being able to move and use his legs. And that's what the difference is. I, I look at Luck as, you know, Luck was opportunistic, mobile, right. extending the play. And remember, Bob, the early years of that, it was his signature and everybody loved it. Look at him extending the play. Mm-hmm. And then when he took so many hits, there was like a breaking point with that initial injury to where, all right, this is not good anymore. And unfortunately, the ball was already rolling so fast down the hill that there was no stopping it. And that's yeah. that's yeah. where you found yourself. Absolutely. You know, I mean, Andrew, Andrew is reckless. You know, I remember that yeah. shot he took against, uh, I think it was the Broncos, when he ended up with a messed up spleen or kidney or some internal organ. But you know they got poor guys urinating blood after the game, and uh, that that's never a good thing. No, so no, <laughs> so uh, uh, you. Know, but you know with Anthony, you're gonna have you're gonna have these called you know designed runs, and he's gonna be in harm's way. And so I, I think this is gonna be an issue that he he's gotta have to learn. You know the education of uh, Anthony Richardson. I think this is part of the part of the education process so bob kravitz again has his column and you can find amusings of adult sports writer substack.com slash at bob kravitz is where you go 
for that. All right, with, with Nick Chubb last night, Saquon Barkley is dinged up. You've got a myriad of running backs around the NFL uh, that are injured right now, starting running right. backs, and then guys taking their place. Uh, does this help or hinder the Jonathan Taylor cause as it stands? I don't think it has any impact, uh, really. I mean, you know, it goes both ways. In, in one sense, I understand you completely understand why running backs want to get paid and they want to get paid now because they're always in harm's way. And we see what's happened with uh, several running backs just in this past weekend. At the same time, you see why management doesn't want to make that long-term commitment to running backs because they are so liable to get hurt. So, you know, I, I don't think it buttresses e- either argument. Um, but I, look, it's going to get weird after four games. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the uh, the uh, options are. But he's going to, you know, you saw the NFL. Yeah, the NFL that was very thinly veiled the pointing of the finger yesterday. I was going to ask your right. opinion on that too. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's pretty clear. I mean, look, we know the guy's ankle is not screwed up. He had surgery back in January. It's a two- to four-week recovery. Here we are seven, eight months later, and this crap's still going on. No, I mean, he's not hurt. I'm sorry. I just – I do not believe it for one second. Um, you know, where you go from here, I'm not sure. It's uh, it's going to get real complicated. Uh, you know, he's going to have to make a decision. Do I play or do I take the fines? Um, you know, he's also got to worry about uh, getting his six games in this year so that his contract – rolls over into next year because if he doesn't play six games uh, he's still on his rookie contract he's still on the third third year of his contract so that that's a real problem so when Steichen mentioned they look forward to his return <laughs> what did he mean by that <laughs> what do you think he meant by that oh i think there's anything else uh, other than no comment yeah it's just yeah it's the same as no comment it's <laughs> well i i yeah, I, I I don't see how this thing gets fixed. I really don't. Uh, I, you know, whether he gets suspended or fined or whatever. Um, now, in fact, I'm going to start making some calls tomorrow just to find out what some of the options are that Chris Ballard may have and, and the options that Jonathan Taylor has. I mean, there's the, the whole situation can't be prolonged. There has to be some definitive decision either way after the next two weeks here and then right. i i mean i like there, there's stuff I, i'm assuming uh contractually and and something with the nfl um that i'm sure that i'm completely unaware of in this but yeah, it kind of me, me too me too it, I, I, yeah. I don't know what the options are uh like i said i'm gonna start making some calls tomorrow and re, you know reach out to some people but um you know he he's he's clearly healthy he's you know, he had that video that he did at the Colts facility. Yeah. I do think it's interesting and good that the Colts don't really want him around anymore, um, you know, while he's on the pup list. Um, they're they're having him come and do rehab in the morning, and then he gets the hell out of there. He's not going – he's not at the games. He's not in the locker room. So, you know, I think that's a good thing. But, yeah, this is uh, – this is just an ugly mess. And, you know, you see Chris Jones and you see Boza and all these other guys, you know, they're holding out and they get signed, but nothing's happening with Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. And it just, it, it kind of seems like with both of those situations uh, from an organizational standpoint, it, it did not get as bad and as negative as ultimately it got with the Colts as far as their running back is concerned, you know? I mean, everybody kind of kept, you know, th- these guys, you, you get the holdout from Jones. He's obviously in a you know a box seat, you know, in a suite watching that yeah. opener on a Thursday night. But I, I don't know how contentious or lack thereof it, it might have been behind the scenes. It just didn't seem like it. And then it was in front of the stinking NFL world in terms of the Colts and Taylor here. Right, but you know they were they were finding. Of course, once they signed him, they they Erase gave it. him all yeah. the fines. So uh, it, it's been weird. Like the the Colts are, the Colts I think could have been harsher in the way they're dealing with Taylor. I think they're trying to play nice nice with him. Um, I think there's still some thought that he might 
he might cave, but uh, I, I don't see it happening. Yeah, I, I like sitting here right now, Bob, I don't see there any way around something like that. And one would be option wise him caving. I, I just don't I don't see any option. I mean, he's, like you mentioned earlier, we've talked about he's got to play at some point. And if yeah. the Colts don't trade him and he's healthy, what, what's the other option for him? I mean, I, I guess you could just get fined and lose money, fined but suspended, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I really don't. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm curious to find out myself <laughs> what, what the options are in the next couple of, uh, next couple of weeks. All right. Uh, what else are you going to be writing about here in the future? And you're on the road with Hagan and I coming up on Friday to Brown yeah, County. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to that. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to go down to uh, the, the uh, uh, to IU tomorrow. They have an immediate day. So uh, I'm thinking Thursday uh, morning I'll write something on Mike Woodson and the boys. Um, and, uh, of course, the Colts game on Sunday. Uh, yeah, but Friday night I'm looking forward to it. Uh, uh, playing golf in the afternoon, and then <laughs> you, guys, you guys are going to drive me down there and take care of me, and we'll go see the Furs and Squeeze. Yeah, what, what do you think and about – go ahead. I didn't even know those two, got, those two, two, two groups were still around. I oh, had yeah. no idea. Yeah, I had I, no idea they were still playing. I just saw the psychedelic furs a little over a year. There's the first band I saw at the Vogue out of COVID. And, right? Yeah, and then uh, Squeeze. I want to say it was they were out on tour with Hall and Oates opening up for them, maybe the year before last, I believe. Okay. So yeah, I mean yeah, all I'm, these bands realize you can make you can make money. I mean look at somebody like Gordon Lightfoot. I mean, that dude toured basically until, unfortunately, he passed away and right, still making right. all that money. So, trying to, at least. Yeah. So. You, know, you know you're getting older when virtually every band that you grow up with, <laughs> they're either dead yeah. or, uh, or, or they've broken up about 15 years earlier. So, I'm glad these guys are still playing. I'm looking forward to going down with you and Hagen. It we, will won't be. Get, we won't get in any trouble. No, none at all. None at all. It'll be a good time, I promise you that. Enjoy IU and Bloomington and, and Woodson of the gang tomorrow, Bob. All right, buddy. Take so Bob care. Kravitz right there. Bob Kravitz with us via the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. Musings of an old sports writer, substack.com slash at Bob Kravitz. Anybody out there make the comparison between Luck and Richardson? Legitimately? Because I think one thing he said and one thing I've talked about regarding that entire situation or the comparison in general is different. And the difference to me is that's how you would have described luck reckless. That was reckless. The situation with Richardson, like it or not, is by design. Everybody loved when luck did it until he was too injured to play. And then everything started going downhill but that that was was reckless. This is their offensive philosophy. This is a reason why they drafted him. This is a major point of their offensive philosophy, what we've seen from him. So to me, there's no comparison. Get your thoughts coming up on the other side, too. Harris Usher Park Race of the Day, 50-50, betting and dining. Harris Usher Park Racing and Casino in Anderson to the winner. And Sandler tickets before the top of the hour, 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan.
Ivan 1075, the fan. Trey Sermon signed to the practice squad, the former Eagles and Niners running back today. Find out maybe a little something tomorrow, later on in the week, I'm sure, for the relative help uh, and uh, concussion protocol-wise from Anthony Richardson. We talked about that with Bob Kravitz a little bit earlier. Matt Taylor, the voice of the Colts, also earlier on the show. Brad Spielberger, pro football focus, and Rake Straw back in the 3 o'clock hour. Two catches, 49 yards, uh, both coming from backup quarterback Gardner Menchu. And I get to talk about the Mallory family, a family I like a great deal. Will Mallory, rookie Colts tight end, on this show tomorrow. Will Mallory. Very excited about that. Whenever I can talk about the Mallory family, whether it's, uh, again, what Bill Mallory, the late Bill Mallory, brought to the football program back in the 80s, you know, some winning, some notoriety, bowl appearances. That group was awesome to watch. Uh, my friend Kurt over at Indiana State. And Will Mallory, tight end, the rookie, joins us coming up on tomorrow's show. Here's Hoosier Park race of the day. Before we're out of here, Jonathan is at 239-1070 right now. Hello, Jonathan. Hey, good afternoon, JMV. Um, I don't know if anybody had brought it up on your show mm-hmm. or some other show, but, um, you know, the do you remember when Michael Vick was um, going through a rough time in the very beginning of his career? Terry Pendleton was kind of his lighting consultant because he was with the Atlanta Braves yeah. back when Vick was with the Falcons. I was, why, why can't the Colts have, uh, like, one of the Indianapolis Indians maybe come in and teach Richardson exactly how to protect himself and slide it doesn't I, seem like that far out of an idea. Jonathan, I said this yesterday. I, I bet you he's going to receive um, a book worthy of protocols <laughs> and how to deal with this now. Because, I mean, you're right. There have been quarterbacks like this, you know, in the past. Even if people reference him as having this type of unicorn effect, we have been down this path with quarterbacks on the move in various situations. I mean, maybe designed runs like this or maybe just being reckless like Andrew Luck was. But there's always going to be a huge stack of pages for these guys to lean on to try to better understand. And and what I try to tell everybody, Jonathan, this is, again, an essential part of the acclimation and the growth process. This is exactly why you wanted to see him start week number one, why there's no just letting him kind of lean into this and starting Menchu. You want him to get all of this, all of this understanding, all of this growth, and some confidence, hopefully, by playing. That's why you wanted to see him in week number one. Even if he does get dinged up, and that's unfortunate. You want to see him grow. This is what this season is about. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that second touchdown, he could have done anything. Like, it would have looked weird to slide in that situation. He didn't see the guy coming. And I can't believe it wasn't a late hit penalty. Um, I guess it could still be a fine because he was already in the end zone when he got whacked like that. Yeah, yeah. That wouldn't be a slide or dive situation. I just... I just hope for the best with him in those situations. Yeah, I, I just, again, just be ready because this is, is not going to go away. It'll probably happen again because it is a design of this offense. And really, it is, I think, at the top of the list of this offense is to get him out, get him out in space. And with that, you know, regardless, we're talking about the end zone with Stewart on Sunday or maybe even talking about a hit you're going to take. You know, in the lower extremities, in the leg area, it is all going to happen. And this is just kind of the uh, the early stages of it until you get more used to it, be able to get past it, and hopefully be able to sustain in a game for the entirety mm-hmm. is the hope one of these days. But you might as well get used to it because it's going to happen more. Yeah, I think the next one for Tua might be the end of his whole career. I mean, doctors say never uh, play after two concussions, and that's a pretty uh... – <laughs> I I think he's already passed that now. (laughs) Yeah, there's no doubt. Hey, Jonathan, thank you for the call. I appreciate that. Yeah, to me, there's a difference. And I know Bob makes the comparison in his column, you know, regarding, I think he called it the vibes he's getting, you know, regarding luck and that and to that of Richardson. But to me, that was, that was completely different. I mean, it wasn't, hey, we're going to get luck out in space and have him run. No, this is exactly what they want to do with Richardson. That's not what they wanted to do with Luck. And a lot of what happened to Luck was Luck's fault. And I think Bob described that right 
I mean, like, even if you look at, well, you wish Richardson would have either, A, seen what was coming or expected what was coming. Thus, he didn't, and now he's in that situation. But with luck, he just running around out there, and he saw that coming, and he took it on. And that led to, to problems, and as we have seen, significant problems. That's the difference. The difference is this is a part of the offense, and with luck, that was luck being reckless, and he was. Everybody loved it at the beginning. You know, being reckless, you know, taking on guys, taking on linebackers, that's that linebacker mentality as a quarterback. Yeah, you don't ever want to say that. Famous last words nowadays. Bill, before the break at 239-1070. Hello, Bill. Hey, J.D., how are you doing today? Am I going to see you on Thursday up in Fishers at Joe's Grill or Friday at Kilroy's downtown, Bud Light Blue Friday? Friday's definitely uh, – nice. uh, and, and, and uh, Big Glenn is going to be there as well. Big Glenn. Him. But we need to extend another invite to yes. Kilroy's. Uh, okay. Gardner Minshew. Why don't we? Why not? Do you think hey, you'd come you down what? and hang out? Come down and hang out. I am on I, – I, I said it on your show back in August. I'm saying it right now. Hold on. The train comes in and out of Union Station. It's the Gardner Menchu Choo Choo. <laughs> this guy, if anybody remembers about Jim Harbaugh and his time here with the Colts, he was uh, he was not the first string quarterback when he started off. He took over for a guy named Craig Erickson that had some tremendous stats and Harbaugh was kind of a, like a cast off from from the Bears and his most famous thing was that he was Pitching at Mike uh, Dick on the sideline on yeah. Monday Night Football, and it was kind of it was kind of intense. But this is the, the Minshew thing and Harbaugh. There's a lot of similarities there. So you know, Anthony Richardson, you know, you are the future. Uh, you know, take the time. I, I think you should have three weeks. If you if you have had a concussion, then he needs to take three weeks off. And we need to really invest in this guy and everything, and that would make you know, that would make him and his people feel a lot better, probably. But uh, but give the keys to Gardner Minshew, man, because that train is leaving is leaving the station, and I, I'm excited to see how the rest of the season goes. Billy, I'll see you on Friday with Big Glenn down at Kilroy's downtown, my brother. You betcha, my friend. Bud Light Blue Friday Rams Colts tickets, by the way, coming at you on Friday. This portion of the show brought to you by Win Schuler's Spreadable Cheeses, the spreadable cheeses that Indy and the listeners of this show absolutely love. Whether you're talking about a barbecue, a backyard picnic, or your tailgate, Win Schuler's, the official spreadable cheeses of the ride with JMV. Quick break, we'll come back. Harris Hoosier Park Race of the Day 50 50, betting and dining on the line. Somebody will win it. And Adam Sandler tickets before the top of the hour. Don't leave.
and 107.5. The Fan. Uh, this is for Gritty Inside the Lounge via YouTube Live. She uh, wanted to hear me say, spreadably moist. Is that what you were looking for? <laughs> yes. I love the fact you guys have the Spreadable Cheese sponsorship inside the lounge via YouTube Live. Just go check it out, too. Win Shoeless. Uh, Kroger and Meyer locations. I've seen it at both places here. Tyler Scanlon takes it home today. The horse was March Telly. Paid two forty and a two dollar bet. The exacta payout was eleven eighty two, fifty cent trifecta twenty five dollars. Your Harris Hoosier Park race of the day, fifty fifty betting and dining goes to Tyler. We do that Tuesday through Friday right here, and you've got racing going on at Harris Hoosier Park Racing and Casino. That is in Anderson. You got it going on until I believe the first week of December. So soak it up and check it out. JMV. In my opinion, it looked like Richardson did see the safety coming and slowed down and willingly took that hit. Speed up and get in and avoid the hit. Again, that's just my opinion, Shane. A lot of people had a similar opinion. Uh, His teammates said that he didn't see him, he being Stewart. But a lot of people, especially immediately following the play itself felt the same thing a hey, number nine at two three nine ten seventy somebody better call right now adam sandler performance gamebridge field house november if you want tickets right now adam sandler number nine at two three nine ten seventy you will go on me thank you uh everybody as always for hooking us up with tickets right here that's a great prize sandler's awesome i love sandler Mostly everything that he does. You know, it's weird, too. I I love, and I watch it all the time. I don't like part two very much, but I love the original Grown Ups. I don't know why. Made back in 2010. There's just something about the original Grown Ups that I really like. Sandler, number nine, to 239-1070. Is this a winner right here? Hey, Kevin, you want to go see Sandler? Yes, sir. You do, Kevin. All right, you got a pair of tickets. November, Gamers Fieldhouse. Adam Sandler, you're a big fan. What's your favorite movie? Oh, um, you know, he's got so many good ones, but uh, I'm a fan of his CD back in the day, a little <sighs> Lunch Lady Land action. Yeah, that's better. That's better right there because that's you know that's, he's going to be doing stand-up and not making a movie. So that's a better answer right there, Kevin. Congratulations. You are on hold. Let James take care of you. A couple of tickets. We'll do that again tomorrow. Adam Sandler tickets. Uh, we'll do that during the show. In Gamers Fieldhouse coming up in November. Derek writes this. So Anthony Richardson just has a little bit of overconfidence because he's often the biggest and the fastest on the field in the past in college. Was it caught from behind or taking big hits? I think he's learned pretty fast. The NFL players can catch him and hit harder. He will adjust. And again, that's a part of it. And that's what you have to hope because it's not like any of this is going away. Yet another good reason why he's out there and playing early. The whole, well, give him time to acclimate if he's not ready. Baloney. Get him out there. Let him figure things out on his own and have the help of his coaching staff. Because this is going to be a priority. That's him running around. Yeah, this is not just mobility being utilized for escapability out of the pocket. Designed runs are going to be the norm. And learning how to deal with that even better, Derek, is something that he absolutely has to do, no doubt. Thank you, James, for the show today. Greg Rakestraw, Brad Spielberger of PFF, Matt Taylor, voice of the Colts, Bob Kravitz, the columnist, podcast 107.5thefan.com. The rookie tight end, Will Mallory, on this show coming up tomorrow. I think Bowen's going to be here, too. More Sandler tickets for you as well. All coming up tomorrow. Inside the Lounge via YouTube Live. Job well done today, too. I'll check in with you back tomorrow.